then around 1987. And his mother was born on an indentured ship to indentured immigrants, but she was not herself indentured. And I know you've had a number of programs about indentures, but it was basically a form of slavery. So people signed away their life um, in exchange for the passage to one of the colonies and then a life of hard labor. And the indentures, the period of indenture was very long. I think for my great grandfather, it was about 30 years. Um, and of course their life expectancy was relatively short and they were guaranteed a paid return journey to their homeland. Um, and they were paid a pittance, of course, while they were working. His parents married in 1912, and he was their first child born in 1914. And there were other children, but only one survived. So the sister um, survived. She married young and died from malarial complications of pregnancy, leaving two young children. So one of the two young children was actually my mother. So they were adopted by Ram Jass and his wife, who had no children of their own. So although I've always thought about of him as my grandfather, he was my, he's my great uncle and my adoptive grandfather. So he brought up my mother and her older brother. Um, and what happened when their parents died was that they, um, I'll come back to that later actually. So Ram Dass attended primary school in Clonbrook. And if you could show the second slide, it just gives an indication of the sort of um, the sort of house that people lived in, except their house wasn't as big as this. It was very small. It was on the ground. It wasn't on stilts, and it was partly thatch. And I've seen a picture of similar houses. And he, he attended primary school, and he fell in love with one of the other pupils, and intended to marry her. But unfortunately, she died in her teens, and eventually he married her sister. But he never tired of telling my grandmother that her sister had been the prettiest girl in the village. So at the end of the indentureship, his father exchanged a right to return to India for this small parcel of land, a very small parcel of land in Clonbrook. And he made his living from basically from whatever he could grow and from, um, from keeping poultry. Um, so they had food, but nothing much else. But his father scraped together enough money to send his son to Georgetown, to secondary school. So my grandfather went to secondary school. He did very well. But at the age of 14, in addition to attending school, he started working at a pharmacy in Water Street, where his duties involved um, making pill boxes, packing drugs, labeling and packaging the, the um, drugs, and then delivering them by bicycle to the customers. So he learned to rap very beautifully, which a skill which he always tried to teach me in field. The next slide shows um, what was then the train station in Georgetown. So he would travel with his bicycle every day um, on the train and then ride from the train station to the school. So he graduated from high school with a matriculation qualification from the University of London. There was the University of London colonial examination. And the qualification would have been sufficient for university entry, but of course, this is way beyond his parents' limited means. So at the age of 18, he started training at the public hospital in Georgetown for this, what was called the sick nurse and dispenser qualification. And the next slide shows what the public hospital looked like really for many decades, for quite a long time after. As a small child, that was exactly what it looked like. Um, in 1937, he was married to the sister of his childhood sweetheart. And what happened in 1939 was World War II broke out. And because the doctors and nurses, the many doctors and nurses from Europe who were working in Georgetown were then sent abroad again to support the war effort, he was posted to Bartica to take the place of the government medical officer and basically to supply medical care to the population of Bartik. I don't think it was very large, a few hundred people. But they found the life in Bartik really difficult. There were food shortages. And my, mother's, my mother was a very young girl at the time. Her education suffered. So in 1942, his 
mother became ill and in fact went blind. And he applied to be transferred back to Georgetown to look after his parents. And he moved his parents from Clonbrook um, to a small house he'd bought in Georgetown. And this didn't go well. You can imagine moving elderly people um, from a country existence to a town. But they stayed in Georgetown until they died. And in that year, he went to work in the hospital laboratory where he began studying for the hospital technologist qualifications. And became involved in hematology mainly and in um, the analysis of blood. So around 1901, blood grouping was discovered. There were experimental blood transfusions during the First World War. Um, some went really well and some failed and, and patients suffered. And it took quite a long time for it to be recognized that there were different blood groups. And in fact, the blood groups are really still being um, discovered. But the main blood groups were recognized in, in the first 40 years of um, the last century. Um, and then in 1940, the rhesus blood group was discovered. And so he started working in that field. And then between 1942 and 1948, became involved in the Guiana malaria eradication campaign. Um, next slide, please, the stamp. The, this is a picture of the, the doctor who was responsible for the eradication campaign. He was an Italian physician who worked with the bauxite company and was then imprisoned during the Second World War because he was regarded an enemy alien. He was released in 1942 because the government felt he was more value as um, a scientist and as a prisoner of war. And he was given the job of government malariologist. So he began a campaign of eliminating malaria. There were three very significant diseases which were causing a large number of deaths in the population. So malaria, filaria, and yellow fever. And he sprayed dwellings with DDT and insecticide. DDT had already been used as part of the war effort for protecting troops fighting in Asia. And it was applied to surfaces where the adult mosquitoes came to rest. A single spraying on the surface was fatal to the insects for many months. And it was a very successful campaign. But the role of my grandfather was to sample and test blood from the residents to determine the incidence of disease pre and post spraying. So he, was, he would go out to the villages and settlements and remember some were in the interior. So they went in these very small planes and did the testing on site because of the lack of refrigeration facilities. So they would take the blood do the smears the, the on slides, examine the slides with microscopes on site um, and report the results. But the overall um, outcome of the eradication campaign was, was excellent because there was a reduction in the deaths of women of childbearing age and increased survival of their children. So in the 1950s and 1960s, there was, as was a, a population increase in, in Guyana which was largely attributable to this campaign. And then in 1952, he went to London. He was sent to the Hammersmith Hospital to further his studies in hematology. So in 1934, the Department of Hematology at Hammersmith Hospital and the Royal Postgraduate Medical School became the leading clinical and research center of hematology in Britain. And many people were sent from the British Commonwealth. Many doctors and technicians went from, from the British Commonwealth to the center to study. So he was sent, um, and he also worked at the London School of Tropical Medicine at that time. He was sent to learn about tropical diseases and to learn about diagnostic techniques for these diseases, and also learn the techniques of blood grouping and blood cross matching which was still relatively new. And I think the thing that struck me was the fact that in spite of the fact this was a small outpost, a small colonial outpost, they were actually adopting um, scientific developments relatively quickly. So 
it took you know 10 years from um, knowledge the knowledge of blood grouping for example to actually penetrate to British Guiana which seemed quite a short period of time so he worked in the hospital laboratory at the Hammersmith doing routine diagnostic tests blood counts and coagulation studies um, and at that time one of the things he found shocking which he talked about a lot um, was the wards full of polio patients who were being kept alive by artificial respiration in what was called iron lungs. He returned to Guiana, off British Guiana after a year and carried on working at the hospital. And then in 1956, he again briefly resumed the role of sick nurse and dispenser when he accompanied passengers on the very last ship the very last indenture ship to return laborers to India. And his job was the medical care of the passengers and also the care of any who died. And this was the only returning ship in the 20th century on which no one died. So he was very relieved. And the interesting thing about there was most of the people who returned to India then came back to British Guiana by air within two weeks because they couldn't cope with the conditions in India. And of course, most of them, they were quite old and they had no relatives left and nowhere to go. They just had this, this vision of, of the home country in, in their minds. Um, so he carried on training and in 1962, he went back to, to London. He was based at the North London Blood Transfusion Center to train in blood transfusion techniques. And then on returning home in 1962, he was tasked with setting up the blood bank in Georgetown. Um, if you could show the next slide, please, because this was the one that was really, not that, no, sorry, that was a royal visit. Oh, sorry, I missed that one out. Um, one of the things he did in between was plan the royal visit of Princess Margaret. Um, in 1958, so he was on the planning committee. But if you could move on to the next slide, please, which is the political leaders. So this is the three political leaders, the three leaders of the three political parties at that time in 1962. And they were donating blood to the blood bank to set an example to the rest of the population. And they basically, um, persuaded anyone visiting the country that it would be a good thing to donate blood to the blood bank. So if those of you, some of you might remember that, that this was around the time of the civil disturbances in Georgetown. So he, he, would, he would persuade all of these people to donate blood. So he would take his team onto the warships um, to, to take blood from the sailors. And back with um, tales of how some of them had fainted because they'd been out on the town the night before drinking rum and were very hungover and dehydrated. And then It some started to do um, something really quite innovative. He carried out the very first exchange transfusion on a baby born to a mother with rhesus antibodies. And this was a life-threatening condition for babies because basically the mo mother's blood enters the baby while the baby is still in the womb. And after birth, the antibodies in the mother's blood starts to de destroy the baby's blood, so the babies die. And this technique of exchange transfusion was only in the UK in the 50s. And he carried out the first exchange transfusion in 1962. And then he took me to meet the baby, actually. I remember one of my childhood memories of um, visiting this family. The baby was thriving. The very a laborious technique, it took about three hours, I think, because it meant withdrawing very tiny amounts of blood from the baby and then injecting very tiny amounts of blood from the donor. And then in 1963, there was an epidemic of poliomyelitis in British Guiana. And there was a total, remember it's a very small population, total of nearly 500 paralytic cases over a 10 week period. 
90% were in children under five years of age. So even earlier in the epidemic, long before the virus was isolated, there had been plans for a field study to examine the epidemic and to evaluate the effectiveness of the vaccine, which was a relatively new introduction um, into the vaccine regime. So there were about 85% of the children in the Guyanese population, age five or less, were immunized over a four week period. And uh, I think one of the results when it, this was all analyzed was that the epidemic might have been stopped earlier if the immunization had been given earlier. But technicians from the George Stan Laboratory were involved in extensive testing and analysis of samples. And these were fecal samples, both pre and post immunization. And so he and his staff, his colleagues, were involved in this. Um, and if you go on to the next slide, please. This, um, this was a paper, it's, it's, I don't know if you can see. Um, in acknowledgements, there's a long list. I'll read out the names. So these were his colleagues at the time. Some of you might recognize the names. There was Gul Khan, George Ripoll, Ramdis Tewari, George Gobin, Cicely Ahli, Eric Sobrine, Mohan Ragbir, Richard Sahai, Eileen Lalji, Luke Passard, who may be on, online, he's my uncle, Dr. Luke Passard, and Jerry Matheson. And then there were three American ladies involved. So this was the first time an immunization campaign had been carried out during an epidemic. And the, of course, we, we were all part of a similar experiment um, last year when there was this mass immunization campaign carried out in this country and all, all over the world in the course of the COVID pandemic. But so this was a prototype for immunization during an epidemic. Something else he'd done when he was living in London in 1952 was to join the Penn International Center, so P-E-N, standing for poets, essayists, and novelists, because he was a poet. And he joined the Penn International and he attended the meetings of um, Penn and he um, was able to listen to lectures given by the eminent thinkers at the time, like Bertrand Russell and Aldous Huxley. So Penn was formed in 1921 to create a world community of writers and to promote intellectual understanding about writers and to defend literature against threats of survival. It was one of the very first non-governmental organizations to advocate for human rights and equality and advocate freedom of expression, peace and friendship. And then in 1962, and this is where we come to words with Macandrew, next slide please. So this, this is the minutes of the inaugural meeting of the British Guiana Centre of Penn. And these minutes were taken by Mr. Wordsworth McCandry. And it was through this that, I mean, many of these people used to come to our home. And I, I didn't know at the time that some of them were very famous authors. So, uh, as a young child, I, I met people like Jan Carew and, and George Lemming. Um, and of course, Mrs. Rajkumari Singh was a regular visitor and a family friend. So this was a connection and I finally found it. So I'll go quite quickly. Next slide, please. He was awarded. He, he received the Independence Medal in 1966, but he also received an award from the Burnham government in the early 1980s for services to um, uh, healthcare in Guyana. And then there's some cuttings, and I'm sorry, they're not very, very clear, but um, so this one, um, this was his retirement party when he left Georgetown Hospital, um, receiving a gift. And then the next one, yeah. Bowing out after 40 years, 
coming back from pre-retirement leave um, and then one of the events um, held in recognition of his retirement. Um, but that wasn't the end because after his retirement, he went um, to work at St. Joseph's Mercy Hospital in Kingston. And he worked there for at least 10 years. Um, he died in May, 1996. And my youngest brother sent me an account of the funeral. He said it was one of the largest ever noted in Georgetown, approximately 2000 people attended. The lodge groups and the uniforms led with a coffin and a decorated open carriage. There was part of the presidential guard with Desmond Hoyt, former president of Guyana, with doctors, nurses and other medical staff he'd worked with and members of the social groups with whom he interacted. So that was the end of a very productive life. So I'll stop there. So thank you very much. Sorry, thank you so much, uh, Vimal. That was so fascinating. Um, I'm wondering if we should maybe ask questions now, or I think it's probably better because um, we're, I'm going to be in conversation with the um, um, the other speakers on today's program. So maybe if um, anyone has any particular questions that you would like to um, address. I'm uh, just going to check the chat to see if anybody had. No, nobody's nobody's got any. Alif, you'd ha you'll have to come off uh, mute. Wanted to know if I could make okay. some comments. I don't know if I'm the only person here who have been trained at the Georgetown <laughs> Hospital and worked there. But I wanted to. I don't know if anybody else have done it. But I was actually trained as a nurse midwife there um, but when I looked at this train station um, your grandfather must have been living on the east coast because even in my time um, there was the quarryman um, you had to cross Georgetown to the west coast by boat yeah there sorry no he lived in Clonbrook on the east coast so it's near it's, um, near Beehive and Mahaika Ah, right yeah, right. yeah. so it was on, the, on that yeah. side of so the that's thing. where the train ran so the train ran I don't know how far it went, if it went beyond Mahaika, but it trained. Yes, but we, had, all we had trains on the West Coast as well, yes. before the rails were removed. Right, yeah. So um, that I, I have in common with the train station, uh, and I, I, I started working at the Georgetown Hospital and the Palm, so I had a career in Georgetown, and um, so I was looking at that in the blood bank, how it was used. But uh, maybe your grandfather, and I was a young girl, when the um, uh, people were returned to India on the first boat uh, and came back because they had lost that intimate um, language and customs with India. So I was actually in Guyana when that happened um, as a young girl on the West Coast. So it was good yes. to hear that, good to hear that. Well, and I was also immunized at school from malaria uh, on that thing that you talked about. Um, we were all immunized from malaria uh, going to school. It was a big program going on, on um, so I know about that. But then um, I must have come after that and um, knew how the blood bank worked because when people came in to visit, uh, most of the time you say, go to the blood bank and give blood so that you had this store of blood for the blood bank. Yes. So uh, I knew about that journey, that some of the journey that your father or grandfather took, and that I'm now, um, um, Mackenzie is now called Linden. So I know of that change as well. And I also campaigned as a young girl for Linden Forbes, Burnham and Chetty Jag. And at that time, when the Black Watch came in, I was there. <laughs> so- uh, Oh gosh, yes. I knew when the Black Watch came in, uh, which was a nice name to have the Black Watch. And then I went Georgetown burned down. And then they had its tricot tobacco factory. That was like very quickly in one week. So I was a young girl there, so I witnessed those things. 
I, I witnessed when the soldiers came back from the Second World War. I went to Tutorial High School. I didn't go to Bishops. I went to Tutorial in Ben Street um, uh, as an under 12. So I did um, uh, my overseas Cambridge from there. So I, it was nice to hear about your, was it your father or grandfather? I made some notes here and thought, well, at least somebody, somebody went there and knows that. And, and the similarity in housing, I, I knew so well, so well that that's, and a lot of those houses are still there, you know? I mean, I went to Guyana uh, 10 years ago and a lot of those houses have not really changed because of how people lived and still do. So thank you for your talk. Thank you. I, I, I could connect with so much of them in a very personal way. Okay, thank so, you. Thank you for that. Thank nice you for that. To hear your memories. Mm. Th thank you, Aleph. Yeah, uh, Vimal, I was, I was really fascinated by that. Particularly, I didn't realize that um, there were still ships returning to India as late as the 1950s. 1956 was a 56, very long yeah. one. Yes, yes. That was, that was, that was amazing. And, then, and what, what percentage of the laborers did you say actually decided to return back to Guyana? I think all of them. I think my, oh, so my, really? my grandfather, what happened to my grandfather, he took the opportunity, because obviously he didn't have to pay for the journey because he's working on the ship, but he took the opportunity right. to visit India. So he had a friend, he had I an see. Indian friend and they traveled, he spent four months, they traveled from the south of India all the way up to the north. And he, he did some fascinating things on the way. I mean, at that time, um, the conquest of Everest had just been accomplished by, uh, um, mm. I think, a New Zealand. Uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, but he actually met with the Shepherd. He met, he came back with photographs of himself with Shepherd Tenzing. I mean, we had those in the house for a long time. Um, the Shepherd Tenzing and his wife and child. So he he took the opportunity, but he also he kept tabs on the people he travelled with. So that's how we knew that they'd um, they, they'd come back. And of course, they all had families. They'd married. They had families. Had children. Grandchildren. In British Guiana, they were, they had no real reason to stay in India. They just clung on to this dream that one day they would return. Yes, that's so interesting. I, I I wondered if he ever spoke as well about his experiences in London. I mean, how did he find? Did he have any particular expectations of Britain moving here and then to discover they were kind of England was a very different place to the place he had, he had imagined. Do you ever talk about that experience? Well, I never heard anything other than positive. I mean, obviously, there must have been racism, but I, I think at that time there wasn't back in 1952. I don't think it was as, uh, I think people of color were still a novelty. And he had friends. I mean, he had, I didn't mention, he, so um, when, when my, um, when they were younger, they, well, they lived in the same house practically from, when they got married at the, at the, during the war. But so their next door neighbor, they lived next door to the Harpers. Um, and of course, um, the, Mrs., um, the second Mrs. Burnham was, was a Harper. Her, her brother, Herbie, um, joined the RAF. So when he came to London, he knew people like Herbie, he could visit him. I mean, he, had, he, had, he knew a lot of people in London. Mm -hmm. um, who had come from Guyana. There were a lot of guys, even then, there were enough expats, there was a community, um, and there were enough people to, 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 to go and visit and, and to do things with. And also my uncle, my, my mother's older brother, was a law student at that time in London. So he wasn't isolated. And then there were colleagues at work. I mean, he made very good friends. And, uh, you know, when he came to, to London to study, he made some very good friends. I mean, back in 19, when he came in 1958, he made very good friends with one of the technicians he worked with. Um, and he kept up correspondences with these people. So one of the people he met in 1958 actually went on to become an MP, a Labour MP. Um, and he took me when I was a young child, he actually took me one of his visits to London he, when I was with him. He took me to the House of Commons to meet this guy. And, and we had the most atrocious lunch in the House of Commons dining room um, overlooking the Thames. I mean, so he, he knew some really fascinating people. Mm. He lived a very full life. That's so interesting. And I, and I love that photograph as well um, of, of all of the leaders donating um, with, you know, with Chetty and Burnham and you know, yes. just, just 
lying down together donating blood and i guess that's that was you said it was 62 or around that i think we thought it was 62 or 62. Yeah. but i think the interesting thing there is that it's obviously you know mr jack and mr Barnum are obviously exchanging playful banter and there's this sort of isolated figure in the corner uh, mr degar looking rather glum yes. um, but and also i think what comes across I, I I mean, because you could see mr Barnum's face was was a charisma mm. You know, you could see that emanating from him. Mm. No, that was very interesting. Does um, I don't know if anybody has any other questions. Um, if not, for the time being, I think we'll move on, and then when we get to the end, we can ask questions. Um, um, yeah. So we, we'll just we'll open open the floor generally. Um, so I just there's there's a, a note that's just popped up in the chat that I that I'd like just to share with you, Vimal. It says um, it's from Rahana. Hello, everyone. Vimal, I'm pleased to see the photos of the home of your grandparents. That's not the I mean, it, it, it wasn't their exact home, but it was just an example yeah. of the type of home they mm -hmm. might have lived in. Um, but um, Rahana is saying, I remember the train station vividly as well as the Georgetown Hospital as I lay there with typhoid and was also polio vaccinated during the epidemic. The street outside the hospital was where my mother stood to wave to me at the hospital's window with the Demerara coolers and I could see the dray carts and women carrying baskets on their heads. Unfortunately, my family has no such photos as we were too poor at the time some of my grandparents also made the journey to India and some of them also returned uh, to Guyana. Um, you know, it makes for very fascinating history. And she just mentions that her grandparents worked on the rice and cane fields as well as the sugar factories and rice fields. So thank you um, for sharing uh, that story of your own family's life as well, Rohana. That was very interesting. Um, I'm going to move on now and invite. So at the moment, let me just. Um, uh, I've got to take the mouth screen. Participants is what I'm looking for. So it's not working. Okay, so. Who is next? We're gonna. I'm gonna spotlight Aleph. Um, um, replace spotlight. Oops. Um, and Farah. Let's have a spotlight. There we go. What happened to Aleph spotlight? There we go. And also to Lalette, if I can find Lalette. There you are, right here. Uh, spotlight, I'll take myself off. You don't need to see me. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Brilliant. So um, just before I, I, I introduce the three of you, I just want to put my hands together for Vimal. And Vimal, I know, I know. Um, you can't hear us. Well, you can hear me, but you won't be able to hear everyone. So I just wanted to say thank you so, so much. You so and much. Um, if if you're here still holding on at the end of the program, I'm sure there'll be lots more questions for you uh, then as well. But just to start very briefly, you, you'll all have seen um, the bios, I think, in the Eventbrite link. But um, just as a sort of brief um, introduction, um, we have uh, Dr. Farah Ramjohn. Uh, who is, I love the description in your bio of the jazz singing dentist. <laughs> um, and then Aleph Harewood, who's been a two-time mayor of Macclesfield, um, but who also was an SRN nurse. And then um, Lilette Denton, who is a, I believe still a palliative care nurse, um, who initially uh, trained as, I believe, a care assistant uh, or healthcare assistant when you came um, to the UK. So that's just a, a very brief biography. Um, and please do refer to the Eventbrite link if you if you want a fuller um, bio for each of our different speakers. But I think initially, I just, first of all, thank you so much for joining us today. And 
in, in a way, I feel really bad because having looked at all of your CVs, I'm like, I could have literally just chosen one person to, spoke, to speak to and it would have got on, you know, that could have taken up a whole two hour program. So I'm very much seeing today's program as a, as a kind of glimpse into the achievements of all of you. And then hopefully we'll be able to shape a longer program um, with a smaller group of people where we can really dive in deep to, to all of the amazing um, things you've achieved but if i can start with um if i can start with you dr um farah ramjan um first of all welcome can i ask you were you were you born here in the uk or did you what was your background did you were you born in guyana so my thank you very much for inviting me first of all it's lovely to be here thank you very much for betty for telling me about this and the wonderful talk that we've had um, briefly here. I was born here, yes. Um, my parents are both born from Guyana, are born in Guyana. Uh, my mum, Chandra, is from Plaisance. I don't know if it's just me. Farah, Far, I think your screen has frozen. To um, buy a village, Matdoom village. And he actually built a lot of the roads and the schools there indeed in one of the, uh, the first stone mosque in Macdoom village he, he built it's still there it's a landmark so if you drive from Georgetown to there you know in Macdoom village from that there but I was born here. Wonderful so um, how can you tell me a bit about your journey into becoming a dentist I mean what was was the how many hours do you have for that? <laughs> <laughs> well I'm just curious whether your parents had been you know any connection with dentistry or yeah, just... I'm pretty much the first and lots of people have copied me since. I grew up watching Casualty and Dr. Quinn Jane Seymour. I thought, oh, medicine, hurrah. I love music, but um, I just thought with dentistry, you've got someone to lay out everything. You can make a mess and you've got someone to tidy it all up afterwards. It's, it's a very... Um, it's very dexterous and in these times I'm very involved with dental politics. Um, I'm part of the local dental committee for Barnet. For five years I was the chair and I've just been elected this year to what we call the GDPC, General Dental Practice Committee, which negotiates directly with government now in these trying times. So it's a very tricky time for dentists, particularly myself. I'm, I've got a practice, it's NHS and private. But I got into it really, um, music, I'm, I'm good with my hands. I love people, I love history. Uh, I had to find out who the first female dentist was, Lillian Lindsay, the first female doctor, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson. These are things that weren't given to me, I had to find them out. So in terms of pioneering women, I wanted to get to that glass ceiling, get pushed past that glass ceiling, you know, engineer all the jobs that were typically for the boys. Um, I have my own practice. I was just talking to my dad today because there was a leak somewhere, but he knows that I'm good with a drill inside a mouth and outside of the mouth. So <laughs> leaks and all sorts of water damage I can deal with. I think for me, dentistry, you're in a very personal space. So people come with a whole heap of, of, well, they've had a bad experience in the past. What are you going to do for me? You're going to give me pain. You've got to do it all in 15 minutes. I have to pay for the treatment. And, and you're in their personal zone. So I think for me, I'm a people's person, really. And, and people that normally would go for sedation, once they meet me, I tell them a bit about me, they, they just stay <laughs> pretty much. So that, so um, I'm, I'm interested actually in what you're saying about the, uh, you, you, you're both private and with the NHS. There are so many changes going on now. And I feel a lot of people feel they have less and less access and, uh, you know, can't afford to use a dentist and things like that. Are you involved in any kind of, I'm just wondering like, do, how does it normally work? A dentist just told what the changes are or is there a way that dentists can feed into the decisions that the government governments make? Pretty much the prior now, it's quite sad. Um, we are being told, I mean, last minute during the pandemic, we were told on a ticker tape at the bottom of a news bulletin, oh, dentists are open on June the 8th. We weren't prepared. We didn't have any PPE. I didn't have any of the machinery. So very much we are on the bottom. With Therese Kofi, she was putting dentistry at least on the agenda. We are right with the phytoplankton below the pharmacist, below everyone else, that we're not in any discussion. Um, we have to do private work to subsidize things. There are many people coming up to retirement age that are leaving. Many people just qualifying that going private because it's quite, I mean, doing this last week in the half term, I was seeing 35 children a week, a day, sorry, um, on top of patients that were in pain. So it's pretty much ongoing there. But um, I remember being back in dental school 
and I was in fourth year and this lady, this professor, uh, Cynthia Pine was giving us a talk. She was on public health, which is extremely um, poignant now. And uh, she actually told us that she was to be our new dean. So this was a groundbreaking moment historically. It was the first female dean of any medical or dental school and the first black dean of any medical dental school. And I was thrilled. I'm into history. This is like huge. I was telling my dad he wasn't too interested. My mum was excited. And, um, and that was just thrilling. And then it came to graduation and it came to the swearing in ceremony and the Hippocratic Oath and, and my dad just came up to Professor Cynthia Pine and said oh your face looks familiar and I said you can't speak to my dean like that and he said are you from Guyana and she went yes so he introduced her to the Guyanese diaspora itself there. Uh, that, that's so interesting I think has somebody got something going on in the background can you please put yourselves all on mute Who's calling me? Hyacinth, maybe. Could, could I ask you to put yourself on mute? Um, let me just go through and make sure that everybody else is on mute. Uh, I am, I am. No, I'm not. I've just come no, on. No, no, you don't need to be on mute. It's, it's for everybody else. I'm just trying to see whose who's radio is interfering. seems to have gone hopefully um i'm going to keep that up there just in case i need it okay so that's that's um really interesting and i was i'm just um i'm wondering if you'd heard of like daphne Steele, you know as the first black matron and and if that had been you know if that helped to inspire you as well in terms of your sense of feminism i didn't hear about her initially i heard about her through agmap who we've got some of the ma uh, founding members um, with us today. One of the speakers is, is talking about that. So Agnam's the Association of Guyanese Nurses and Allied Professionals. And um, I, there's a found, there's a, that's, that memorial is quite important for that organisation and there's bursaries and all sorts of things involved with that. So I, I did lots of performances for Agnap. Over the last 15 years, I uh, performed at the Central Methodist Hall, jazz performances. Um, it was very um, classically biased so I did a lot of jazz there but I was involved with Agnap and I was vice chair for a little period of time but during that that's where I heard of the name but not prior. Not prior okay so I, I was wondering as well when you were saying that you were like a jazz uh, jazz singing dentist if you'd ever been tempted to actually have a professional career as a jazz singer rather than you know did you ever have a tussle between whether to be one or the other? I went to Trinity College of Music when I was young from 13 to 17 every Saturday and I had the I saw the most talented people, violinists, everything. And unfortunately, we know that there was just a limited ceiling for them as where they can go. There's only a limited space. You had to have the right manager and that sort of thing. A lot of my friends are musicians, professional, nearly all my friends are professional musicians. Um, a few of them Guyanese, funnily enough. Yeah. And I actually like to keep it. First of all, I'm not good enough professionally to be a professional musician. They, they train nine hours a day and I'm, I mean, the top of their game. But I think I like to have it as a hobby. When you have it as a hobby, you can enjoy it. It's stress release. It's I need it now in terms of dentistry, something else to get your mind away from that. Um, but I'm doing a bit more jazz piano now, but no, not as a full time. I think for me, in terms of Guyanese heritage, there are three things that Guyana sort of means to me, and that's food, family and education. And food, everyone's mum's the best cook, mine, mine included. Family, everyone that's Guyanese is family. I have patients that are Guyanese and they've come to see me perform. And there's this Guyanese woman at the Lloyds Bank in Camden. I let people go in front of me <laughs> just so I can deal with her and have a long queue behind me. <laughs> but, uh, but in terms of education, I mean, it was quite still. I had a, a bit of a yin and yang parenting. One parent really fostered academic success, which really held well during the pandemic. I mean, so many of my friends were off work, didn't know where they'd get their next penny from to pay bills um whereas dentists we had other problems we were up there with ent surgeons and and um anesthesiologists in terms of the close proximity we were to patients when we didn't have the adequate ppe but then the yang my mum really instilled music music um public speaking acting but and i need them all now with patients i mean i remember in dental school we had a someone who was third year very young boy and he just left, he went into law because the abuse that he got, it's nothing dental, 
how old are you? Are you young enough? What do you know? But you know, you have all this thing, you've got the whole cross section of the public you're dealing with. So you need to be able to hold your own really. Well, I'm going to come back to you, but thank you for that. I, I, I just wanted to switch to a completely different kind of historical juncture because I'm I'm looking at Aleph and I, I, Aleph, I know when you you um, moved from Guyana to the UK, you came here to train as a nurse. I'm just wondering if you could um, if you could maybe talk to us about your background and, and what led you, what was that journey to becoming a nurse here in the UK? Well, um, first, uh, um, thank you for having me. My history is quite checkered, uh, quite checkered. I, I, I was orphaned with both parents before I was three. So I, I was brought up on the west coast of Demerara, born in Kitty and brought up by grand grandmother. And um, I got a scholarship of under 12 to Tutorial High School. So that's how I went into secondary education. And most of my life, I've done things by default. I, I just dropped in somewhere. So um, I took the entrance exam and got in as a nurse, trained as a nurse midwife in Guyana. But then we had this change of political view where most English people were leaving Guyana and we were never in the management positions in the, in the nursing sphere. Most of the managers were British people, even in the shops, bookers um, were white people. So I came with the idea that if I get the blessing of England, I will know what to do when I go back. Mm. Um, you can see I never went back um, mm. because life took over. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the um, peculiar histories I have is that I ended up without a break in service, have done 59 years of nursing mm -hmm. and 20 years as a politician, because I always dropped into bits and pieces of things. Um, um, so I came to England with that idea. And, and you, um, the, one of the speakers, uh, I'm so blessed for her to hear, that her father always had friends. I found England a lonely place and, and, and very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, and that road of difficulty, um, I think was held by a lot of people where because life was difficult for most of the people I knew, we were not able to help each other. Uh, and I take that as red. People were not able to help you because they were in the same thing. And most um, nurses lived in little rooms and they couldn't take anybody. So that's why I came. And then I had to redo my state registration and state certification. And, and I trained as an occupational health nurse because um, I realized that most, nearly all black nurses didn't get promoted. So I, um, I went somewhere else and did eight years of factory work and industry as a occupational health, health nursing officer. And still I found that difficulty. So I came out, I worked in prison. I, 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 sent, I, went, I, I don't know where I didn't go really. I went, and lots of agency work. So my life was fractured uh, because by the time I was widowed, um, I had four children. So I was a single mother with four children. So uh, I had other difficulties, social, economic, housing, that sort. Mm -hmm. And I fell into things by, by default. When, when somebody didn't want to do it, I said, I'll do it because I had to earn a living. So I didn't have a straight um, uh, kind of working, working history at all. Mm -hmm. um, in that history though, I, I decided that I had to open this dialogue that was missing in, in this society in which I found myself. So I went into volunteering, even while I was a trained nurse midwife, I went into the political thing because I felt that dialogue had to be held and, and worked at, I'm still, I'm still there. So, so that's, that's why I came. Um, so I did not have this um, 
lift up. Um, I, I had to do what I could and look at the next generation. I became a school governor for 30 years. I became all kinds of things. But um, to go back to um, uh, Dr. Farah, I, I, when I meet a guy, and he's, I, I, I grab them hard. Me too. <laughs> Are you from Guyana? I could hear the accent. Hold me close. <laughs> and, and, but as I'm sitting here, I have not seen another Guyanese in over five years. Um, I, one time I never saw another Guyanese for over like 15 years because this is a little town in Cheshire where black people did not live. No, no, no person of color lived uh, because the culture was from the good people, the bad, at people in different people, you do not belong here, please leave. And, uh, or you could not wish to stay here, please leave. And, uh, and you do it, you did. But you can see I didn't have that option. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm still here. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I don't know what else I can, can say. I, I did a lot of post um, employment degrees I went to university when I was retirement age. I did international, I did a master's in international politics. I did contemporary theater. I did social sciences. That didn't get me a job, you know, because there's, you cannot, I'm still in polit, two political um, uh, areas. You cannot change 500 years of culture in one generation. Mm. And I feel you have a duty to, to keep that dialogue going, good, bad, or indifferent. So I, I, I'm still... I, I, and if I'm I still, say, I, I, I know that you, um, your, your journey, I mean, you've had a lot of challenges on the way. And of course, you and I have spoken about this um, in, in the past. And I know just in terms of getting housing when you came here was difficult. Um, one of the things I think would be really nice to just share as well is your experience of while you were training. I mean, when you got the qualification, I believe you mentioned something to me about them not wanting you to even have the top grade or something for oh, you. Oh, yes, you could share yes. that story. Um, I trained in, I, in, I end, first had my retraining in, in, a, in a hospital in Haraldwood. And um, I, I, because of whatever, all the ramifications in the hospital, I happened to come first. And then I was called and told by the matron, we cannot allow you to come first. Um, um, and I agreed, I agreed because what the matron said, you did. And just, uh, just to stay, just, to, just for someone to have me. I agree, I agree. And hallelujah to the youngsters who say, I, I will not agree. But, I agree to everything because you have to survive. And so I, I could not come first. And, and when I came in this house and the neighbors had a petition to move me because they never lived amongst any black people. So, so, so Aleph, just so that the, the audience understand, when you're saying, you know, um, cause way back in the day, I know certainly like for the, in council housings, for example, um, people who, the, the white people who lived in the properties had a right to say whether or not they no, wanted it, a black yeah, person to yeah, move yeah. in. Yeah. And so how did you actually manage to overcome that and, and, and get well, a place? I, they, I found out that they, all they had to do was a petition to say we don't want anybody black live here. So you, the, but I, I just wrote a poem called The Angels in My Life somebody came to visit me and said and went and spoke up for me and say tell them you're a taxpayer tell them you're a, you're you're um trained person did you not say that and i said no no and this, he said go and tell him that <laughs> and so at the same time the houses were for sale the council houses mm -hmm. and that's how i got housing otherwise um uh, then an indian couple in the, in the town bought a house and then everybody puts up their houses for sale. So, but I survived as you can see. 
I'm still, um, I, I must be still the only black person. We were the first black family in this town. Yeah. And it's hard to see another black person mm -hmm. because the culture doesn't allow it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I, it's not that I'm being whatever, but I find even the best people hold that line that you are not welcome and it's best for you not to live here. It's different in a city. It's different when you have um, a people around you, but this is not a city and, and you got to be wealthy to overcome that. And I, I never was that, you know? And because in, in spite of my qualifications, I never rose to any kind of um, uh, part of the, the, or of the, of the sure. organization. Lynette, sorry, we can hear yeah. you talking. I never sorry, had that sorry. power to fight them. Yeah. I, I address things more now because I do not work yeah. and I feel that I can address that for yeah. other people, no, having that life experience. Yeah. You know, yeah. I have nothing. I have nothing to lose. I say I can do it. And I, I, and I just it. think you you provide us with a really amazing example of of someone who's of that kind of Windrush generation. You know, I mean, because I remember even you telling me about um, you know, when you'd left Britain to return to Guyana. Yes. And I think it was round about sixty six, just gone past sixty six, and you tried to come it back. It must be sixty eight when 68. I was told my. My, I still have that passport and it was cancelled at the border. And yes. when I came in and yes. said, you're not allowed to come back because by then Guyana had become independent and I hadn't thought of it. No, but so I when mean, I went you, it, you, it's in common with a lot of people because every a lot of people I've spoken to had no idea that uh, yeah. when, 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 when any of the colonies became independent, that would automatically lead to them losing their British status. But what I thought was fascinating um, with you was the way that you were saying that maybe they'd let you in because of your SRN badge or- Yes, they, I had the badge. You had the badge. Uh, yeah. Somebody just chatted me. I tell you, because I know I'm speaking to friends, so a lot of my, my history, I'm too ashamed of it. I'm too ashamed to say it. Oh, Aleph, don't, don't. We're so proud of you, honestly. You know, <laughs> when, well, you know, I'm, you know I'm phenomenally proud of you. <laughs> but um, through Fluke, um, because of those angels, I received an MBE in 2008 or something. And I was so blown away yeah. that um, I went and got it from Princess Anne and, yeah. and the Queen and that sort of yeah. thing, you know? So yeah. that gives me great courage to carry on. And and, uh, and, 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 and Aleph, you know, that's why I said that I felt a bit guilty about today's program, because I know yeah. literally with each of you, I could I could talk for an hour and more. Um, and, and because it's really unfair in a sense, um, because you have achieved a phenomenal amount. And you know, I was blown away when I actually, <laughs> and, and, and not just because of, but you know, just because I was thinking of the background as well. I mean, your start in life, and I remember you saying something about your grandmother talking about your station in life. I, I can't yes. remember the saying. What What did she yes. say? She said, "Your your your ambition is more than your position. Why do you want education? Yes, and and your ambition is more than your position. So when um, I was taken out of school because she felt I had this one, I had this thing for education." Uh, and uh, because I was given this on the 12th scholarship. And she said, what do you want education for? What do you want education for? Uh, you want it done better than are we? So, <laughs> so she, but in spite of that, I became a nurse and um, saw the first non-white matron at Georgetown Hospital, which was Irma Prendes. And then I realized that when you get the British qualification, you can go back and, and do those things. But it is not so now uh, because you now they have the Guyana Danish University and the nurses um, are qualified from there. Yeah. But um, the road to England um, where I, my own, my own um, uh, experience had been, 
where most people of color lived in poor housing, poor jobs, poor experiences, poor health. I still take that as a beacon for the challenges I must face, must address. And, so, and, and, and Ailif, I must say, we owe you a great debt of thanks, really, because I know from, especially because of your kind of activism, really, within the community and the way you've helped to bring in changes to Macclesfield, um, you know, and obviously that that peters through to, to the society as a whole. So I just, on behalf of everyone, I just want to say a huge thank you. And, and also, um, I, I know there's somebody in the room here who does um, oral histories with um, um, nurses, uh, who, people who've contributed to the NHS. And if you were interested in sharing your experience as a nurse, um, I'm sure that we could put you in touch with somebody who would really love to cover the story in a lot more depth. But um, because I, I can, Abigail Bernard, I can see she's on, she's online today. And um, very kind. yeah, so, <laughs> but, but I, I, I want to, um, I come back to you um, and Farah again, but I want to move now to just talk to um, Lilette Denton. And um, Lilette, firstly, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think we first, we first connected with you um, because you were doing um, the bereavement um, surgeries during a uh, lockdown. And uh, I'm sure they were really uh, very needed because I know certainly between Rod and myself, over 20 people we knew had died from COVID during that period. And um, so, but I'm, I'm really curious as to how you started your career as a, a healthcare assistant and whether, uh, when did you come to the UK from Guyana? Thank you, Winita, for having me. And thank you, Betty, for recommending that I come on. Thank you so much. Um, I left school St. Joseph High and I went into um, teaching uh, just as an assistant for one year. In, in, I had to travel up to Burbies at a week on Sunday, came home back on Friday. And I found that really, really stressful. And so I decided to go into nursing and I got a job at the Woodlands just so that I could be near home. And in fact, I enjoyed nursing from way back, being in the Red Cross and being looking after children in the convalescent home. I went into the Woodlands and that, this is where I um, started working as the healthcare assistant, as we call them now. So I work with Dr. Fungafat. I, I really excelled. And when you excel, they put you into the operating department and I love it, but I kept writing to many, many hospitals over here as I went along and eventually I was accepted by the Wrexham Park Hospital in Buckinghamshire. And that's where I came over and I went straight into, I came over to family first and then I went into my nursing in the September. And then from, from there, of course, when I went up into Wrexham Park, they put me up into, into accommodation and I did, but I did my SCN training. I did not do my SRN at that point. And a lot of us listening here would know that although you came from a good background, you came with your A-levels, they assessed where they were going to put you. And I ended up working as an SCN, training as an SCN. And after that two years training, I came down to the Whittington Hospital in London. And I did a year training because I loved teaching nursing at that point coming up from Guyana with that experience, I went to the Whittington and I worked there for one, for about three, two years, I think it was. And then I moved into Great Ormond Street because I wanted to, 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 I wanted to see how it was with kids in the operating department. And then fortunately met my husband at that point and found the journey too much for us because we had moved home. And so I came up to Lewisham Hospital and I worked in there operating departments as well. And I was there for quite a while, number of years until 1985, I think it was. And then my husband decided to start a business and this is where I had to take a career break. So I took a 13 year career break from 1985 so that I could help him in his business. And then I came back to nursing after everything was settled. I got itchy feet, I wanted to come back in. And I, at that point in 1990, they had started nursing as a profession where you did your degrees and, and you can work up to masters and all that. So I came back in 
1998, I think it was. And I started studying. I really loved the study. And I went, I did my SRN. I did my, my I did a degree in, in, in um, community nursing. And so I became a community nursing sister in, in Peckham area around Southeast London. And then I did a master's. And then I felt there was more. I needed more than just being a community nursing sister. I hadn't found my feet as yet. I hadn't found what I wanted to be. And I had always loved looking after people with it at the end of life, palliative end of life care while I was a sister. So I decided that I wanted to go into hospice work. And I got a secondment into Greenwich and Bexley Cottage Hospice. And I did a one year secondment as a palliative nurse. And then I thought, you know what, I'm still not enjoying this because I feel as if I'm uh, still a, a, a nursing sister going around assessing people because I really wanted to teach. So then I went into, um, I decided after that one year secondment, I started looking around for various teaching jobs and I got one with Bart's Health. They were starting a coordination unit for people with palliative end of life care. So where you could ring in and you could have, you could, there's somebody sitting there to advise you on palliative end of life care. And I got that post. And that post was funded by Marie Curie. Unfortunately, after three years of doing that post, we lost our money. So I had to now look for another job. So I ended up at St. Christopher's Hospice in the care home project team, which is all about education, which is where I really found my feet, all about teaching the nursing homes in Croydon. And for anybody living in Croydon, you've got about 40 something nursing homes. So my role was going into the nursing home, teaching the staff how to manage end of life care, talking to patients, talking to relatives. And then in 2018, everything changed. Wow. Two, 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 2018, I, um, Agnap, heard from Agnap saying that there was somebody coming up from Guyana and can I look after that person? And my, my director came to me as well and say, we've got a nurse coming from the Beacon Hospice. And I said, well, I didn't know there was a hospice in Guyana. She said, yes, can you look, look after that nurse for us and um, make sure that she's comfortable, make sure that she knows what, you know, show her around, look after her, which I did. And we got talking and, and I was really excited that there was a hospice in Guyana. And therefore in that, at that point, I started um, investigating what have they got? What do they have for education in Guyana? How are the nurses trained in Guyana around palliative and the life care? I wanted to know everything. We just would talk and talk for weeks and weeks. And then I had this idea, I went to my manager and I said, you know, to my director at the hospice, and I said to her, I want to give back something. Can I, can I, um, will you support me if I decide to go down to Guyana and do some teaching? Because there's nothing they have, they know nothing in palliative end of life care. And the hospice agreed. And she said, but before you go, I want you to go on training. So I had to do another three months, another couple of months of training. And then I had to go, because with that training, which is quality training, quality, end of life care for all, that gave me the power to teach anywhere in the world. So she wanted me to have that. So I said, fine, I'll take that. I went down to Guyana in 2019 and I spent one week, two weeks with the hospice, one week teaching, one week of going around with the nurses so that they can shadow and see the patients in the community. And then I came back. And when I came back, I thought, well, the only way I'm going to carry this on is if I start my own, my own charity, which is giving back to people, which is how am I going to manage? How am I going to take this forward? So this is where I, in 2019, October, I launched SOLIC. And SOLIC is my charity that we now give back to people in Guyana. And also in 2018, uh, 2017, I decided I wanted to give back something to my own community. And this is where the bereavement calf came in, in 2017. What I did, I went and trained as a doula. And a doula is someone that sits with the person at end of life. You don't do anything practical. You just sit and support the family. And I did a year training on the, as with the doulas and it's really empowered me 
to think further, what did I want to do in the community to give you that, that energy to, to think for the community. So in 2017, I went into my local authority and I said I wanted a space to do a bereavement calf because I didn't like the idea of calling um, a dead calf. And that's what the doulas believe in. They, they call it a dead calf. And I thought nobody will come to my calf. So I'll call it a bereavement calf. And I was given that space in the Pearly Library in, in, mm. there in Croydon. And I would take one day a week, and this was from 2017, one day a week I went into that, a month, one day a month on my day off, I went into that calf and people would come in and I would give advice and they would ask me anything. It doesn't matter, one person even came in and asked me for a job at the hospice and I was able to signpost her. People were coming in and asking me all sorts of questions to do with absolutely may not even be end of life care. But I was sitting there for about two hours, one day a week, and then COVID hit us. And I had to completely think differently. And for that, I one day just dawned on me, why don't, because I couldn't go back into the library during COVID. And it just dawned on me, why don't I go viral? Why don't I go online? And from then we've taken off. So during COVID, we went viral twice a month because there was a need for it. And now we still carry on our bereavement calf. And when I say about bereavement, people are scared to join us. It, we, I feel empowerment, being aware is the key because we know that a lot, lot of people in the BAME community do not want to talk about death and dying. And in my bereavement calf, my real aim is for people to be comfortable with talking about death, dying, bereavement, talking about advanced care plan, talking about what their plans are for the future. And, I, and we do it in such a structured way that it's not a frightening arena to, to come into. And then um, I started, I, I must mention this as well. In 2018, Croydon Council had given us some money. So no, they had given us in 2015 and they told us at St. Christopher's, St. Christopher's that we wanted you to um, put the same structure of education for carers that you're doing in the care homes, we wanted that in the learning disability homes. And so we use the structure that we use for the nurses in nursing home and we completely turn it around. Not me, me and my colleague, she's now in New Zealand and we had an admin with us and we turned it around to, to, to uh, facilitate those nurses in learning disability homes because we knew that staff in learning disability homes have no experience of caring. They're just mainly, most of them are there to look after people, feed, wash. When a person is becoming less well, they may not be able to recognize that. So we wanted them to feel comfortable in doing that. And we wanted also for families to understand what it is to look after somebody at the end of life, palliative end of life, thinking about advanced care plan for their loved ones, because we know somebody with a learning disability is going to die, is may, may die 10 years before any of us will. So for that, and that was a fantastic project I worked on, for that, we won the Linda Mackin Hill, Hill Award. And that is an award that is given every two years by Linda Mackin Hill, who looked after her daughter at the end of life. And she now gave that to the Palliative Care Association to anybody that wants to think about anything outside the box, to be innovative in your own way. It can be a carer, it could be nurses in learning disability homes, or it could be us from the hospice that were thinking in a different way as well. So then I did that. And um, so that was the Linda Market Hill Award. And then the COVID hit us, of course. And I decided, I got up one morning and decided I wasn't going to work for anybody. And I handed in my resignation there and then. I didn't even, I was so stressed during COVID that I, I don't even think I passed it around anyone to say, well, you know what, don't do it, Lilith. I just got up and wrote my resignation. And since then, I find that things have just exploded again for me in that I'm, I'm independent. I, I can, people can ring me up for advice. That's the way I work now. I don't charge anything. 
I've got people that ring me up and say, mom is dying, what should I do? And I'll say X, Y, Z. And through those people, I've, I've built up uh, a community of people that feel that they can call on me anytime. And I've also, um, I've also looked at how can I take that forward? And with Solid, which I've started a charity, I came up with the idea that I wanted as well to, to think about people in Guyana. So along with professionals being educated in Guyana that we sponsor with our charity, in 2020, we were giving medication, we were paying for medication because in 2019, that was a big issue. And we were really concerned that people were not getting their morphine tablets, their morphine injection. So what we did in 2019 is lots of, ne lots of negotiation. And then I thought, you know what, we need to, we need to really give, be, be active, be proactive by helping these people financially. And in 2019, 20, well, about 2021, we have helped about 26 people all attached to Beacon Hospice with their medication, their morphine medication, because at that point, there is morphine in the country, but the government, and that's been resolved now, couldn't, um, they weren't paying the, the suppliers, but now that is all resolved. So Linda, now, can I, can I ask you a quick question about um, the funding? Because when you say you, 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 you've set up the charity, how, how, how is the charity being funded? I mean, how do you get the money to do the things that you need to do? Well, well, Renita, I started off, and lots of people listening here will know that I started with pennies. I would ask people to give me all the coins, all the, 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 and I'll go collect wherever. I, I, I don't know what they call me, but I was collecting, and even now I'm collecting coins from anybody. You know, people have their jars of coins. And I felt too that, and lots of people ask me that question, Renita, how do I manage financially? And, and I must, I must, um, I must say I depend on a lot of family, a lot of family, I know they're listening in here now from America, they do send me donations. And also um, I put my own donation there. Mm. So that's how I started. I remember going into the bank and telling the bank manager what I was going to do. And he thought it was a fantastic idea. I was going to, my plan when I started the charity was to bring, um, bring professionals up from Guyana and give them the experience in the hospice as the nurse from the hospice had. And then COVID hit and we couldn't do that. So what I did was paid for the two nurses in the Beacon Hospice to have their, their um, to attend the, the, the academy via Zoom. Mm. So long with doing that in 2020, we were paying for medication as well. And then we started, I started thinking in 2021, you know what? It's not only about the professionals and the life care is about the people on the ground, about the patients. And what I did, I started another arm of the charity, which is anybody that needed help financially, we would give that help. So um, this year, just an example, this year what we've done into in May this year, we sponsored eight, um, five doctors from Georgetown Hospital, and we sponsored two nurses, and we sponsored one um, um, social worker to attend palliative end of life care through the Institute in Delhi. And also June this year, another initiative we did, which I was really brought to tears, was helping somebody with their radiotherapy. So if you know someone in Guyana, radiotherapy is not free, chemotherapy is free, and so is the CT scan, which I heard yesterday, only yesterday, that from the 1st of November, CT scans at the Georgetown Hospital will be free. Chemotherapy is free, radiotherapy is not. So the, the, the patient have to pay some of the money towards the radiotherapy. So for instance, radiotherapy is 600 and something Guyanese dollars. The government will pay about 600 and 600,000 Guyanese dollars. The mm. government will pay roughly 200,000, which is roughly a third. And the patient have to find the rest. 
Now this lady needed the chemotherapy this year, June, and we got the call out from hospice, can you help? And that I don't work with my charity unless they come through the hospice. So I'm I, very just, much aware that just... there's a lot of people would ask me for money and I'm not giving it that easy. Okay. So anybody coming through to our charity, it's true the Beacon Hospice have to be referred by the Beacon Hospice and have to be assessed as needing yeah. that treatment. Okay, Lilette, can I just um, ask you, just because I'm aware there'll be maybe people in the audience who may be able to help in terms of funding the charity, because I think, I mean, it's amazing that you've done all this, sounds pretty much off your own steam, and um, but really as a community, there's a big community out there who could be helping you with this, so I'd, I'd quite like to put the details of the charity in the chat. Um, so, and, and so my understanding is it's called Supporting End of Life Care Education. Yeah. Okay, and so where do people go to, I mean, where could they go to get in touch with you if they wanted to help with some funding? Well, I'm on Facebook, really, and people can pick me up on there. They can see a lot about what I do on Facebook. Okay. Um, just put a little dent in and you see what I do. So um, do you, um, do you have a, a, an email address that they can contact you on? I've got an email address, which I probably have to run from here and give. And I'll don't, that don't worry if, it, if it's the same one that i use for you normally i'll put that one in the chat you, you can use that one and i've got one. one i've got one for the charity as well but you can use that one yeah. for now and okay. anybody sending yeah and this year okay we and, it, and, and just we if, had our, if, if they sorry. want to sorry lila if they want to make um donations what do they what, what can they do well they can send me um um just contact me and then I'll give them the details you. of yes. Okay. Contact okay. me and I'll give them details. Okay. And I know oh, that this yeah, sorry. No, no, I was just gonna say I need to I need to um just move move on a little bit because I'm conscious of time. Um but so if, if I can just ask you to say on a kind of final note, what what have been the biggest challenges for you in terms of, of working with Guyana and, and and what and what have been the successes too? What have been the main Oh, I think the successes are great because, yeah. and I think it's only since I've been in contact with the diaspora, I've been in contact with Dr. Lal at the um, Ministry of, Educa of, of Health. I've had a meeting with her and um, because I came up with this plan that I wanted to have um, a palliative, a, a cancer care, um, what you call it, support um, room or, or space in Georgetown Hospital where people can come in and they can access what care they want, what financial, and also a point of contact, I call it, point of contact in the Georgetown Hospital. And they've agreed, so I'm waiting on that now. Um, hence why I need finance. And I've also been, um, Dr. Lal has also asked me to do a, um, a program so that we could put that into the Guyana School of Nursing because I have trained the Guyana School of Nursing, but because it, there isn't a strategy, there isn't um, um, anything saying that you have to do this training, um, this is why it, um, the Guyana School is not ready. Um, I've done two lots of, the, of training with the nurses in the Guyana School, and Dr. Lal has agreed, can I put a program in, and they would make it mandatory. So for me, that is a big plus, and the big plus too, is, is people can now have their morphine medication because the government is making sure that the beacon is having their medication. And I, I said to, to Dr. Lal, you can check the, 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 your website, your, your emails, and you can see where in 2019, I did send an email because I was so distressed when I got a call from the beacon saying that they had no medication and people were in pain. And I think you wouldn't even let your dog be in pain. And I was mm -hmm. so um, upset that day. I sent off an email straight away to the Ministry of Health in Guyana saying how disgusting that was. Mm -hmm. I am really, really happy now mm -hmm. to be working with the, the, the Ministry of Health and they're moving things ahead and I'm, it's, it's a way forward. And we could be one of the, the, the leading in the Caribbean because I know um, the, the Palliative Care Association, Caribbean Palliative, Care Association in Jamaica has been trying for a long time to get every Caribbean island up to speed 
with palliative and life care. And mm -hmm. it has been lots and lots of drawbacks. And I work closely with them as well. And this year, I send them a donation, a small donation, so that they could carry on their work as well. Lila, can I just ask you, where is the Beacon Hospital in Guyana? Oh, it's opposite Georgetown Hospital, exactly it's opposite. opposite. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You can't miss it. Nobody can miss it. Mm. Okay, thank you, um, Lila. I'm, I'm sure everybody here is really uh, amazed by the um, efforts that you've put into um, helping people in Guyana who are in that situation. And I think one of the things that really, I mean, unfortunately we don't have time to go into, but I'm really struck by uh, how amazing you must be as somebody who wants to work in palliative care. I think dealing with end of life care is extremely difficult for families and obviously as well um, for the person who's dying. So I really take my hat off to you because I, I think it's an amazing uh, job and wonderful as well that you did the doula training um, to add to all the other skills that you had. Um, I just wanna move on very quickly back um, to Farah. Uh, Farah, can I just ask you of all the things that you've achieved, what are you actually now most proud? Oh, you're on. Yeah, yeah, I unmute myself, you, sorry. Yes. I don't know, that's on the spot. I think being auntie to an incredible six-year-old niece and a very energetic two-year-old nephew would probably be the best thing. Um, I think just being inspirational. I've taught young students non-medical things and even the staff in my practice. I, I think I, I inspire them to be better. Um, but I think, yeah, my niece and nephew. I, I'm just curious as well. I mean, I don't know what the figures are for the number of women in Britain that work as dentists. And I don't know what they are in terms of um, women of color, but you must do. You, have you ever felt sort of like you're on your own out there or is has the scene changed sufficiently that now you're kind of like, well, we've broken that ceiling. There are lots of little answers to that. Um, one is in the GDPC, which is this group, this committee that I mentioned. Um, lots of male, a handful of women and two people of colour, two women of colour in that handful, and I'm one of them, that's in that. In dental school, um, I was a year of 58 people, a couple dropped out or failed exams, it went down to 56. Um, in that year, I went to a reunion about 15 years ago in Liverpool, um, four people of that 56 own their own practice, and only one was female. <laughs> um, I think, I, I don't think being of colour or gender is actually relevant now um, to certain people. I know part of the LDC, it's this group, political group that I'm part of, that I was chair for a while. Um, we had uh, my, my uh, secretary, um, Alan, he was always pushing me for things to be part of this federation of London, we, just because I was a little bit outspoken, I think. And um, that was just because I was going to have a CQC visit, the Care Quality Commission, um, can shut you down and, and I was about to have a visit so I was very vocal at meetings saying what do I need what, what's this what this when I just bought a practice and I was just pushed for different things and I think I'm lucky in that respect um, it doesn't really affect me I go for different things positions um, whether they're medical non-medical I've always been school counsellor when I started dental school vocal in a variety of things so I think my 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 viewpoint's a little bit skewed because I've always had opportunity and people have shoved things at me, so I've just accepted it. Whether that's medical or musical, I've just gone on with it and gave it a go. So, so one thing I'm really interested in is in terms of fact, having been born here and, and very much brought up here, um, what what would you say that's um, what's influenced you about being Guyanese? I mean, that having that Guyanese heritage, is there anything about it that you feel has been a key shaper of who you are today? I think, what I, probably what I mentioned before, I mean, just the things that, that the passions of a lot of Guyanese people it is education, really. It is food when you're around them, you, that sort of thing. Um, just those, just the, the country itself and, and getting to meet more people now. Um, yeah. That's Thing. Yeah. yeah, lovely. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And then I just I wanted to end with a final question because it's, it's, it's up to five o'clock now. And um, so but uh, Alif, I have a question for you. If you could meet your younger self, what advice would you give? What would you give yourself That's now, <laughs> having, having gone through your extraordinary journey of life? 
Oh, yeah. I, oh, I can't hear you, Aleph. Sorry. I'll, uh, can you unmute again? Yeah. Thank you. My younger self will be go go for your dreams. Um, go for your dreams. Learn to mitigate nicely what challenge. And listening to Dr. Farah, I think to be proud of what I have done is to make changes in this community that for the better that have never been thought of mm -hmm. in the history of the community, mm -hmm. that those changes have been made that made a difference to life, initiatives, health, death. Mm -hmm. And those are the things I hold dear. Mm -hmm. But my younger self, I always believed that my bad times were, were just a phase. I'll get over this. <laughs> Mm. I'll get over there. And can I ask um, um, Mrs. Denton Linnett, in Georgetown Hospital is on both sides. Where is the hospice located? Within the hospital? Oh, sorry, Lynette, you're also on mute. It's on both sides of the road. No, it's in front of one of the, the, the entrances. <laughs> As you okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Over it's, a chemist. Over a chemist. It's Thomas okay. Street. Thomas Street. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. Street. Thank you. Um, ladies, I, I, I'm so sorry we haven't got more time to talk because honestly, it's been fantastic. And I think what I'm taking away from this is that all of you have had careers, but you've also gone way beyond your career to care about the community and the people within the community. And I think that's something that's to be hugely applauded and, um, you know, makes I think all of us feel very proud of being Guyanese. I know Guyanese always seem to go over and beyond um, you know, what they do just in terms of their, you know, the job that earns them the money, you know, and so, and, and just that spirit to keep going. So thank you to all three of you. Really, really wonderful to hear. And I hope we could do a, a, another one of these sessions later on next year and, um, you know, have a part two of the conversation. So thank you so much for, for this guy in a speaks. <laughs> Okay, um, I'm going to just uh, remove all the spotlights and then um, we'll come back later in case of any um, questions at the end, but I just want to spotlight now. Um, let me see if I can find you. Peter Ramraker is somewhere. Um, let's see. Um, Peter, 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 where are you? Next oh, to you. <laughs> next to me. Oh, yes, you are now. Now that, now that you're talking, I can, <laughs> I can spot you straight away. There you are. And also Lilette. Uh, Lilette, Lilette. Here's the Lilette. Um, let me just spotlight. Oh, I can't well, spotlight. How come I can't spotlight Lilette? Well, maybe I need to do it a different way. Okay. Um, Lilette, are you, are you there with us? Can you unmute? Yeah. You can hear you can hear I us. I can okay. hear you. Okay. Yeah. I'm just trying to see if I can spotlight you. For some reason it's not working. I'm just gonna try again because it'd be good to have you both both on the screen. Um boom boom boom. Where have you gone, Lynette? Sorry, I can't see it. Here we are. No, for some reason it won't let me. Are you, are you, have you got your video on? No, yes. Have I? No, I can't, oh, no, I no. can't see you. No, the video is on. Okay, maybe I'm not looking in the right place. Let me just go to full screen for a minute. Yeah, okay, well, I can't see you, but so I think um, I'm gonna ask Rod to help you sort that out if you don't mind Rod and then I'm going to start with Peter um yeah if you can if you can just call Lynette because I can't um have you got her number um yeah um 
Yeah, because Lynette, Lynette, unfortunately, you're not. Um, sorry, Lynette, you're not yeah. um, on the screen. I can't see you. So I think Rod is probably going to call you. Okay. Uh, to try and sort that out. I but, don't know. Okay. Yeah, sorry, I said Lilette when I meant Lynette. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, not yeah. Me. Not yeah. you. Not yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, not me. Okay. Um, so not Peter, me, Rod. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Peter, obviously, we know you as a, as a senior healthcare uh, management executive um, of, I believe, 61 years um, experience. I just wondered um, if we could start just by talking a little bit about your background in Guyana and how you came to settle in the UK. Thank you very much, uh, Juanita, um, for the invite. Um, and uh, I'm happy to, um, to be here. Um, I was born in uh, Unity, well, in the Haika, uh, but my, my ancestry is in unity. Um, in those days, in 1943, uh, the woman would go to the village uh, to have, where she was born, to have a child. So, uh, Aja uh, was from unity, my Aja, my father's father. So we are unity uh, people, really. Um, and, uh, but very early on, um, my dad uh, decided, like many of the other speakers, uh, uh, that he would look for better opportunity. Uh, so we moved to Georgetown, uh, New Market Street, uh, not far from the government's house. So I was uh, uh, very uh, happy to hear about uh, the Black Watch and the Argyle and Southern Highlanders because in 1953, they were marching uh, across um, our, um, our shop. We had a shop in New Market Street near the Woodbine Hotel. Um, so my early years um, was spent in Georgetown. Um, I went to St. George's Anglican School. Uh, so I know all high church uh, practices, although my um, uh, family, my dad was Hindu uh, and uh, my mom was uh, uh, Christian and my grandmother, my nanny, was Hindu and Christian uh, and my stepmother was Muslim. Uh, my mom died in 1948 and uh, um, my dad uh, married another lady, my uh, mum, who was uh, fully uh, Muslim. What was interesting was that um, uh, none of those uh, uh, of those three main religions had uh, any conflict. Uh, we we I, I went every Wednesday. We went across the St George's uh, Cathedral Wednesday morning, and uh, we saw this man with a, a black gown and uh, a pink face, who was the um, uh, reverend. Uh, and we learned all about uh, the uh, Christian uh, tradition. Uh, but we didn't practice religion in the way that it, was, it is practiced. I mean, it was more uh, the celebration of events and so on. And uh, so I grew up um, in, in Georgetown. Uh, walked from uh, Newmarket Street through Tiger Bay uh, to St. George's and then uh, the parade ground where we spent a lot of time and uh, the Botanical Gardens was there. So quite a, an enjoyable uh, multicultural uh, uh, upbringing. Uh, we had our fights. The fights were mostly on uh, different things. Uh, in, in, and we will all go to the parade ground uh, um, uh, to, to have the fights. And we, we played cricket um, with the walls of the uh, cathedral being uh, the background. Um, so that was my, um, uh, my school life. Um, uh, when I reached 17, um, 
uh, my dad uh, thought rather than um, wait, we, we weren't sure what to do with me, um, whether continued uh, on to the high school um, or um, uh, do a real job uh, because I, I, other than um, stealing um, the cheese and rolls uh, from the shop and eating the profit, uh, we would um, do all sorts of naughty things. So in actual fact, uh, at the time, it was thought that I, I would, <laughs> for some reason, um, I, I, I always wanted to be a lawyer, uh, but um, there were other pressures at the time. And um, my, they thought that whilst uh, waiting times, I, I will be, uh, I should go to be a postmaster. <laughs> I mean, this was, I mean, there weren't many Indians uh, postmasters at the time, um, uh, but you had to deliver telegrams um, whilst you're waiting, and then you have to take a, a, a postal apprentice exam. Uh, for I, I was thought to be fairly bright, I don't know why, um, but I, I missed um, when you uh, when you're very successful uh, and you do, did very well in a class, you can sp skip a class. So I skipped third standard, then I went to fourth standard, as it were there. Um, anyway, um, I did the postal exam and I brought first in the country. Um, now, at the time, you, you, can't, you couldn't really um, sort of develop properly uh, unless you become a, a, a full postman or, or a, a postal apprentice. So because I was so successful and I lived in Georgetown and I hadn't uh, traveled beyond Mahaika to any extent, I was then sent to Skeldon, Springfield, which was the other side of the world for me. Um, Hello. And, and, and then I was Show me a moment, um, Peter. Nolette, yeah. thank you for joining us. So we've got you on the screen now. I'm going to chat with Peter for a little bit first, but stay with us because I'll come to you straight afterwards. That's yes. fine. Okay. And, Sorry, Peter. And, and yes. So, so I was sent to Skeldon, um, and I had the full gear, um, a um, oh. cork hat, no, it is um, people. and uh, the, um, the trousers. Oh. Was were, were very tough serge and um, uh, brass buttons, which had to be. Uh, so um, it, it struck me that what am I doing in Skeld? Yeah. Because uh, they, they got sorry, me. Sorry, Peter. L L Lynette, Lynette, sorry, Lynette, just to let you know, we can hear you in, in the background. So just if you could keep it on mute just for now. Thank you. Sorry, Peter, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so so um, I I decided uh, with with my um, dad we, we thought well this is an interesting life because I had a, a huge house um, rented a, it was rented for me overlooking Crabwood Creek River the the river um, but you know Skeldon uh, from Georgetown in 1960 was like going to the Mars for, for a young 17 year uh, boy. Uh, so uh, we decided that um, to get on further in life, I will go to the UK. Well, no, I will go to London. No one talked about the UK, so we will go to London. Uh, at the time, um, I, um, my brother who has unfortunately died uh, recently uh, in the UK, um, he had joined the Royal Air Force and he had said what, uh, you know, quite interesting things. And I thought, okay, um, I will thank Guyana for their um, upbringing, but I, I'll try my luck um, in the UK. Uh, so I arrived, I, I, um, I came as many of the colleagues in the call will uh, recognize. 
Um, I came yeah. with the, uh, well, we flew from uh, the airport uh, in Guyana um, to Trinidad and then got on a, on a boat, uh, a ship, uh, TV Venezuela. And TV Venezuela went first to uh, La Guaira uh, in Venezuela for what I, I can't recall. And then we went to uh, Martinique and Guadeloupe. And for the first time in my life, I saw my fellow um, uh, black colleagues speaking and I didn't understand what on earth they are speaking because that's a French, uh, 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 well, they're French, uh, de yeah. departments they're not they're not independent country yeah, yeah. and and uh, so um that's a, a, a brief summary of the upbringing in Diana until i uh, came to the uk so i was interested because i know that you um served within the royal air force medical branch and i, I was just sort of wondering uh, so that's like 1961 to 70 i was wondering what was involved in that in that role um, at the time, um, my, for two things. Firstly, um, I decided to join the Royal Air Force as a way of studying, and then um, just for a short time. But regardless of uh, which career in the Air Force you follow, for airmen, we're now called aviators. The government has joined, we're not called call airmen anywhere, uh, any longer, because that, that is sexist. So all Air Force people of my generation now are called aviators, although we've never flown, actually flown, fly the aircraft, we, we will be supported. So we, ha we had to do the military training at first. So in 1961, uh, July, I went to uh, Bridge North in Shropshire. Uh, the, one of the coldest winters uh, in, in Britain. And uh, so we had the sort of uh, training, um, military training. Although I was in the medical branch but, uh, mm. and going through, we had to do basic training. Uh, so we were all leveled. Uh, so I was able to you know, do the uh, military things that you would expect a military person to do. Um, and um, I trained, uh, firstly, as what is now called a paramedic. Um, so uh, uh, three months of training, actually like a, a nurse. Uh, in fact, the, the title was nursing attendant. Uh, that would lead on to becoming a, a medical administrator and so on, but we had to do that medical training. So um, uh, from... Uh, Early life in from 1960 on onwards, I stayed close with nursing and medical and in the medical world. So I eventually um, got promoted and so on. And then after five years, I then became in medical administration, which I've stayed in uh, until now. Um, uh, and and during that time, um, the interest uh, was. Uh, aroused in uh, following continuing studies, but um, doing actually working in the Air Force. And fortunately, um, for the last five years, um, 1965, 1970, um, I worked at uh, the headquarters of, of, of the Royal Air Force Medical Section in uh, High Holborn. It's above uh, uh, um, a pizza shop uh, now, and I think it's still there. Um, but but essentially, um, looking after um, all the um, senior uh, ranks of the, the Royal Air Force, um, from uh, air marshal to pilot officer who worked at the Ministry of Defence. So for the last five years, I was. Um, in, in um, working uh, in Hoban. I lived at Axbridge and um, uh, we would wear, the, put on our uniform, but uh, just the trousers and the boots and so on. 
but put a jacket over our brothers. You see some policemen who go to work. Uh, they put a jacket on. With, with the, so we had the shirt and the, um, the tie and so on. Uh, but but, but uh, we, we traveled on, on the tube from Uxbridge. And anyone who knows the journey from Uxbridge to High Holborn, uh, at the time, uh, mini skirts and all that were, were in the swing. So um, it was a, an interesting time uh, to travel. But uh, everyone read the newspaper. And for some unknown reason, I got started to read the Telegraph. I wouldn't read the Telegraph now if you did. Uh, but but, but, but um, that was the, the, the journey. And that was the start of a, uh, a career um, that has continued to now. That's a really fascinating. And I, 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 so I know you've been this, um, the chair of um, Guy, Guy Hal since 93. Can you tell us a bit about Guy Health? What's, what is it, what's the group made of, made up of? Right. Um, it, it, um, when the, the, um, the government, there, there was um, an outbreak of cholera um, in Guyana uh, around about 92, 93. And Gail Teixeira was the Minister of Health. And she came to Britain to try and uh, uh, get the support for what the government of the day was doing. Um, I am a people's person. I always like to work with people. Um, and I get on with most people. Um, and I um, had done different things um, uh, in the uh, community. Uh, we formed the Indo-Caribbean Cultural Association, ICCA, uh, which had functions for um, uh, everyone, uh, but recognized uh, Eid and Diwali. And we had uh, quite large gatherings in, in Tottenham. Um, but I always had an interest of bringing the races together. Um, I was political in the sense of British politics, and we might touch on uh, those later on. Um, so um, I had good contacts, and I had started um, working with Lynette and with Betty. Uh, dear, Betty is, is almost like my sister. Every function, every organization I've been, Betty is there to support me. And dear Betty, Thank you so much. Um, so um, what we did um, was um, at the time, uh, Lal Singh was the high commissioner. And I chatted with Lal. Um, in fact, I chatted with Lal um, on, I think, the week or the, uh, when he was going to be high commissioner, because we had uh, formed uh, a, a group um, called Guyana Medical uh, Groups, uh, words to that effect. Um, but um, there was an encouragement for us to, um, to widen uh, the, the scope. And um, we got together nearly 17 to 18, uh, maybe more, 17 organizations plus individuals. And I was looking um, through the names and some of the people are on the call who were there. Betty was certainly there. Um, I don't know whether that, um, that was, that's the, um, the uh, can you, is it, can you see that? We, we, can, we can't quite you, you can't see, see yes. Background. But yeah. anyway, the, the, um, some of the names are um, uh, Lynette Richards, uh, Inis Corbin, uh, Mike Sewak, Betty and John Y. Um, uh, Bruce Nobberger, Chris Chunilal, Les Samuels, etc. All of these, my, what are my life story? I'm, I was fortunate to have done a, a book called Recycling the Son of the British Raj. And all that I'm saying is in this, this, this book. I, I was going to say, because, because I mean, I, you've had a really long and fascinating career. And I think, um, obviously, we can only scratch on the surface in, in, in this Zoom. So I'd really encourage people to uh, get a copy of it. And I think, I believe it's on Amazon. 
Um, uh, don't don't get it from Amazon because you'll pay. Get you, you, you'll get the full price. If you want to get it, um, uh, I, I've got a website. You'll see my uh, email address there. Just drop me a line, and you get it at a, a much cheaper price than uh, um, Amazon is. Uh, well, and is, also we don't really want to go via Amazon if but, we can help it. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Th um, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I'm just wondering as well, because you, you, you had um, worked on a, on a really major project to do with mental health at Springfield Hospital. And I, I, could you share um, some of that work, just explain to the audience what that involved? Right. Um, well, after I left the um, Royal Air Force in 1970, I was fortunate um, as a brown person, as a... a what we call ethnic minorities, so it will be the majority really, um, uh, in uh, the National Temperance Hospital in uh, University College Hospital Group in London. I became what was called a Deputy Hospital Secretary, um, which is not secretary like that, um, was the second in command of the, um, of, uh, the hospital. The National Temperance was a small hospital, um, and then um, I progressed along the administrative uh, hierarchy. It was unusual because at that time, uh, people of color didn't go into general management. Um, uh, Eilid mentioned about the problems that she had. Fortunately, as a young guy and uh, from the Air Force, I didn't take anything like I, I go for a job and uh, Fortunately, I was able to persuade, I mean, I, I left the, the Air Force in July, uh, or July 1970, and I started at National Temperance in October 1970, and then uh, uh, had a career that reached the top um, of the administrative um, ladder in 1985-86 as the district administrator of Dartford and Gresham Health Authority. Uh, but in particular, I was always interested in learning disability and mental health. I played a leading part in the closure of the Darren Spark Hospital in Kent, when the government was closing large learning disability and mental health hospitals. So I acquired quite a lot of experience in the policy and the management of, of uh, large institutions and uh, decommissioning of services. So um, in my career, I actually uh, closed, um, unfortunately, hospitals by what I'm proud of is uh, at Springfield Hospital, um, there were many old buildings, but the, nothing could be done about the buildings because they were short of money. And I was um, recruited uh, because of the experience I had in, in policy and project management and an accredited uh, project director uh, to lead a £7 million uh, project at Springfield. That project uh, enabled me uh, to spend some time in prison. Um, I had the, the joy of going to Broadmoor uh, because we were um, looking at uh, introducing ligature. Uh, I Sorry about that. Well, I don't think it's on Broadmoor that we were in. Uh, it sounds like we were in Broadmoor temporarily. <laughs> <but>. <laughs> anyway, um, so that project, um, seven million pounds, uh, uh, an 18 bedded hospital. Uh, um, well, it's a hospital, it was built in such a way that it could be transformed into an ordinary uh, building. And special things were. Uh, like ligature um, uh, concerns because uh, the toilets and so on 
are not the usual toilets uh, because of uh, um, concerns that people might kill themselves. Uh, so uh, there were ligature concerns in the building. And that was um, very, very um, uh, interesting. And it was the first project. Bearing in mind people of my background are developing policies and procedures and so on. Uh, but as a project director, I was leading a team of multi-skilled uh, 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 people, high professionals, architects, uh, engineers, etc., cetera, um, to produce something that would last at least 60 years. So uh, the success in doing that project led to another 23 million, so 30 million pounds uh, projects at um, Springfield was the enabler uh, for what is now called the Springfield Village. If those of you on the call who live near to um, Tooting will see that there, there are buildings that are going up. Well, I, I'm proud, as you ask, uh, Juanita, to have been at the uh, leading edge um, of those uh, two projects, both of which uh, were com commended uh, uh, building uh, better uh, buildings uh, award, national award for um, mental health. So um, that was something that really gave me tremendous pleasure in uh, providing much needed facilities for people uh, as a step down. So from, from uh, a prison environment, they will go into the second project, which is called the One Wood, uh, Wandsworth Recovery Center, and then move out into the community um, with, cons uh, with, with facilities for people who might need uh, greater care, um, uh, psychiatric intensive care uh, wards. Um, so um, bringing uh, Cinderella type of service up to date, and that has given me a uh, tremendous pleasure. Lots of uh, exciting and pleasuring, pleasurable things that I've had in uh, Botswana, Tanzania, Tanzania as a um, mission director of a flying eye hospital going around the world. Uh, but that was particularly uh, interesting um, uh, project to have completed, which um, would last for 60 years, so it will last, uh, outlast me. And you, I, I, there's a plaque that uh, Peter Amreko is the project director of this, and it's been written up in various um, professional uh, documents. So, so P Peter, I wanted to ask you, because I think most of us have a, a, a clear idea in our head as to what nurses do, or doctors do, or, or dentists do, or even if we're not clear, we think we are clear on it. And I just, I was just curious as, as I think um, in terms of healthcare management, it's not often an area of, of, of the medical services that we think about a lot. And I wondered if you could just sort of talk to us a little bit about the kind of people that you would be liaising with on a, on a normal daily basis. And if it's, and I'm just wondering, are you having to, um, in terms of what the direction of a project, who, who are the people who are making all the decisions? Are you kind of working with a team of people, with the architects, with, you know, if you could shed some light on exactly right. what's involved. At directorate level, um, I would have responsibility to the board. Um, uh, so uh, um, as an experienced project director, uh, I would be given the authority to form a project team to lead a project team and to engage various professionals to bring that project uh, to, uh, to, to fruition. It's just like um, a home. The only thing is that you have to consult a range of people um, to get the policy, to get the support of the community. I had to go, go um, around uh, um, the uh, stakeholders um, in Tooting and um, uh, the surrounding areas, explaining what the project is is going to be, and uh, in particular, 
seeing what benefits would come from the patient to the patient and and, and or, or the resident because we use the resident as a more comfortable word than a patient um, and uh, so I will coordinate will set up a project plan um, how are we going to spend the money firstly who we have consulted to bring this project to, to fruition uh, and uh, you know it's like planning permissions you just think about a big building that is going up, like the ones that are going up next to me here, 15, 16 stories. And uh, you have the uh, agreement from the community to go ahead with this project, the, the, the local authority, et cetera, uh, has to be involved. And um, the project, you're going to be spending 30, 000, 30 million pounds of public money. And therefore, there is accountability how that money is going to be spent. Um, so a project plan is agreed, uh, and you as the project director, the leader of this multi-faceted team, uh, to deliver it. Um, and uh, with, with me were, were uh, two consultant psychiatrists on the team, uh, a, um, a senior nursing uh, uh, representative, uh, the representative from um, the users. So a range of people are gathered and we then agree uh, how the facility would be provided and at the end, how, it be, how we will identify whether it, is, it has fulfilled its remit. So a post-project evaluation is done as to how we have spent the uh, 20, 30 million pounds of public money. So um, as a trained person, um, I'm trained in general management uh, and I'm trained in project management as well, which is a specialist part of general management. And um, that enabled me to deliver the project um, on time and within budget using a, a, a procurement uh, process called P21, uh, which is not a secret service number, but it's, it's the name of the, the type of project that is produced. So uh, the project uh, management is similar to um, what uh, you would have to run a hospital. I mean, I was the uh, chief of Blusham Hospital, uh, and, and you develop those skills along the, the, uh, along the way. Uh, we are sometimes regarded as people who interfere with the um, uh, wishes of the uh, clinicians, the doctors and nurses. I'm happy to say in, in my working life, um, uh, 33 years in um, the Department of Health and, and the NHS, I've, I've worked well uh, with, with um, uh, uh, clinicians. Uh, my the people who hold my title now are the chief executives of the of the trust. The trust are hospitals, and uh, they get two hundred and eighty five thousand um, pounds a year. Um, mine wasn't so great, but it was quite handsome at the time uh, relative to to to, to the, the the levels uh, um, that uh, um, were were. were uh, uh, used at the time. So um, it was an exciting, it is an exciting process, yeah. um, but it isn't an easy um, uh, route to follow uh, because, as I said, there were the, the discrimination was, um, uh, was more covert than overt, but it was there. Um, the nursing people, my colleague nurses uh, on the call, um, they would have experienced it much, much more intense as frontline than I, I had done uh, during my years. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that, Peter. I, 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 I would love to hear more. Unfortunately, we're really tight for time with it now being quarters of six. So um, I, I'm going to say thank you for now. We may have some questions afterwards, but I'd like to um, just move now 
to talk to um, Lynette. <laughs> Lynette, thank you for Hi. And I wasn't sure whether we were going to get you on Skype, <laughs> on, on Zoom for a moment. So, uh, yeah. Hello. Thank you. Have you got enough time? <laughs> well, we've got, we can have about 15 minutes and then okay. we're, yeah. So let's That's just, fine. Um, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm so sorry that you've had to wait, wait so long as well. So, uh, but um, can we, can we start with, with where you were in um, Guyana? What, a little bit about your background? My background, I, I lived in Reckonrest, Georgetown. And uh, that is where I was born, the same house I was born in and lived there. And we went to Tutorial High School. At, that was my, my secondary school. Gained my, my senior Cambridge. And also attended Burroughs Art School, where, where I met people like Stanley, Stanley Graves yeah. and under the tutelage of E.R. Burroughs. And undertook uh, a job after, after high school. We, I went to medical department to work as a medical secretary, where I worked at Georgetown Hospital with Dr. Herlinger and had wanted to do nursing. But at the time, it was very difficult to get into Georgetown Hospital. And I thought it would be a good idea to go to England because I heard that England had the best nurse training and had a friend called Reverend Goodridge. He recently passed away. And I spoke to him and asked him, if I went to England, where would I, where could I go to England where it would be warm, warmer than it is for the rest of the country? He said, oh, go to Somerset. That would be the best place. So I, I applied to Somerset and started my training in Taunton where I, I, I did very well because, because I became the best practical nurse of the year and won the prize for that. And uh, during that time, I, I got a, an invitation to attend Buckingham Palace. For some reason, I was appointed to go to represent Guyana and um, met the queen. And, and that was in 1962 when I did my my qualification as an SRN. Then I went on to do midwifery in, in Cheltenham and in Birmingham and completed that. And Sorry, went on to- I, 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 Can I just stop you for a second? Cause it, you've just slipped that in about having dinner with the queen <laughs> and moved on rapidly. And I, I just wanted to ask you, what was that like? I mean, in 1962, that must've been a pretty amazing occasion. It's, it's, 1962 was a, it's an exceptionally good occasion. It was it was wonderful. It came out of the blue. The, the letter came, and the matron called me to her office. She held the letter and she said to me, "Then that why are you getting a letter from the Lord Chamberlain?" And I said, "I don't know." So she said, "Well, I'd like you to open it in front of me to see what it is all about." So I did, and uh, it was saying that they. The, they asked me to represent Guyana at, at this garden party. And uh, at the time, I, I really didn't know why I was chosen, but it was, I thought maybe because I'd, I'd become top of the nursing, practical nursing um, prize for, in Taunton. But I really don't know up to this day why they chose me. However, I enjoyed the occasion because I met lots of people from the Commonwealth in diff from different parts of the Commonwealth. And it was, it was a really wonderful occasion to meet the Queen and met uh, Prince Philip at the time. And of course, that was 60 years ago um, now, when, when you think about it. Yes. And uh, I mentioned it at, in, in Facebook because I thought, well, I went to the lion service when, when she was um, in, in lying in, in state. Yeah. And I thought, well, that was the second time I was going to be in her, her presence. So that was that was my my um, beginning of my training. Um, should I go on or? Yes, I, like I, to... I'm actually what I'm trying to do is bring up your um, there's a little presentation, I think, that your daughter's set trying to send through to me. And I'm just going to open it up. 
Um, so okay. It. There we go. So. Um, oh, think, that, that. Yeah. So this, I think this, it's Father Goodrich. But let's start with this picture here. Who, who's who's in the picture? Well, I'm at the end of the picture with okay. my parents and my brothers. Right. It's just before before I left home. Uh, uh, okay. Last picture with my family. Yes. And uh, I was thinking, and that was Father Goodrich telling me about coming to Somerset and going to going there. And I stayed with his parents for two weeks before going off to Somerset because he arranged that because he thought, well, it would be nice for me to see London before going off to to Taunton. Um, and uh, and the other picture which is there. Um, that is myself and my sister in the middle there. Mm. When we were leaving home, that was our going away picture. But did because she also go into nursing? She, she didn't actually do her training. She, did, she was engaged and she was more keen on getting, getting married than, than, <laughs> than get, getting uh, her qualifications. Yes. But nevertheless, she, she went to, to Oxford and did nursing assistant work. And then she got married and she stayed in Oxford until she died last year. Okay, okay. But we, we traveled together on the Orangistad for three, on, on, on a journey which lasted three weeks. And of course, it was when, when we landed at, in Plymouth, that was the, the, the last time we saw each other. The other picture is just in front of my house in Palm Street, and that's Father Goodrich uh, receiving his um, award of merit. And that's me as a two-year-old. <laughs> okay, okay. So I'm curious okay. about, um, uh, when, when you trained as an SRN nurse, when you first came in, in, in 1959, was your plan to go back to Guyana or had you hoped to settle in the UK? Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I think I think most people would say yes. The plan is to go back, and I and I did go back. I, I from the time I started training, I started saving to, to go back because I, I really wanted to to go back home. And my 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 salary was nine pounds a month in my hands, and out of that, five pounds were sent home, and a pound was saved. But by the, by, by the end by, by the end of the the training and, and midwifery training, I went back and uh, at that time Guyana was having a lot of problems and my dad said to me, "Look, I think you'd better go back to England and when things have settled down, you can come back." But then I got I came back, I got married, I got my daughter. And then I, I started having going career, my, my career to look at. And I became yeah. a district midwife and uh, moved on from there. Can I ask but you- But my heart was always in Diana. Uh, sorry, sorry? I, I had a question about, I was just really curious about this, this 1962 period you're talking about where you were visiting the queen, but it's also the same context just shortly after the Notting Hill riots in 58 and then the Immigration Act in 62. Um, and I'm just, yes. I'm, I'm just wondering what was the actual um, mood of the country at the time when you were here, how did you feel with all of that going on? Um, it, it, it didn't affect me so much when I was in Taunton. Taunton, I had a wonderful time in Taunton. When I went to, to Cheltenham and I finished my part one midwifery, I needed to get, between part one and part two, I needed to get a job as, as an agency nurse, just to, to fill that gap until I got my results. Because our tutor said to me, to us, all the, all the students, you, you can, you can, work as an agency nurse and then go on to do your part two. So I went into an agency in, in Bristol at that time where I was staying and they, they looked at me and, I, and they looked at my qualifications and they said to me, I'm sorry, we don't take people like you. And that, that was really the first time I've actually faced that sort of um, 
sort of rejection in, in, in rejection. sense. Yeah, yeah. And 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 that that was sixty two, sixty three. That was during that time. And uh, and then after I, I I had to live on my savings until I got my my job as as a, a, a then part two um, student midwife. Then went on to Birmingham, and of course Birmingham was 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 a different scene altogether because they had more black people, whereas in Somerset it, it did, they didn't have black people in Bristol. Bristol always had a little bit of a name for for that sort of thing, uh, where they there was some discrimination. So that that was the only time I felt really, oh, you know, rejected and sent to you, you can't get a job because because they don't take people like you. So that was it. But when I went to Birmingham, Birmingham was was completely different because they were used to black people and. Uh, in fact, when you went on the buses with your used uniform, they looked after you. The, the, the bus conductors were black then, and they just let you on the buses, and that was it. Mm. So people so, really respected the uniform, actually, at the time. They, they? they respected the uniform, yeah. and 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 uh, I, interestingly enough, in 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 Taunton, when when I was doing my training, they, 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 I, I I didn't nurse any any black patients, not one. Um, it looks like you're in the dark. Just, I, I don't know. If... Yes, I'm in the dark. Okay, okay. Um, oh, the light is bad. And now you're in okay, the dark. Okay, I'm okay. Again. Sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry. That's okay. So I just okay. I, I wondered if we could we could talk about this um, picture here because so you mm -hmm. did you you became an SRN nurse, but it you then undertook um, training in midwifery, and I was really interested as to why. What sort of drew you into that um, midwifery? Well, it, it, this, this is a story. My dad has got great influence on me. And he said to me, Lynette, if you're going to do nursing, do midwifery as well, because you will be never out of a job. He said, and uh, he's, he had a, 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 an aunt who was, who was a midwife. And even in her 70s and late 80s, she was delivering babies in, in Guyana. And uh, it, it was something that attracted me very much. And when, when I started learning to do midwifery, I really loved the job. It was, it was something that after going into management and all that, I always looked back and thought, well, it's the job that I enjoyed the most because I loved being with the mothers and 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 trying to give them the, the sort of delivery that they, they would look back and enjoy. So th that was that was the love of my life, midwifery. And so here in this, this we got this image here, photograph here of you as the first um, black lady as a unit general manager, as the director of nursing and midwifery. Yeah. Um, yes. Are you are you in this picture? Is this you in the front row or? I'm trying to see where I'm in the picture of the front row in the red red skirt. Ah, okay, okay. Yes, yes. I, 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 I. Once I, I went into management with because I, I worked as a, as a midwife for seven years and then started going to the management role. I became a nursing officer and senior nursing officer. And when I went to Wandsworth, within six months, the person who was my boss, who was the divisional nursing officer left and 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 they said to me well you can apply for the divisional post because i'd only been there six months and uh, and i got it and then after that there was another reorganization and that was when the nhs had directorships and i was appointed as the director of nursing admin free which meant i looked after midwives, nurses, and and the whole of the midwifery services in Wandsworth. And after, uh, then again, another reorganization came about. This is what to do with general management. And then I became a unit general manager for women and children and, uh, and looked after not only nurses and midwives, 
but I looked after the medical staff, the whole of whole of general management. And in fact, in at, at St George's, um, Peter was talking about about um, looking up being the commissioning. I, I looked, commissioned the the Lanesborough Wing, and that became the wing which opened after the South London Hospital was closed, the Weir was closed, and the Hyde Park Corner Hospital was closed. And all these hospitals I was responsible for, together with the community services and the, the nursing school of Midwifery. And, and then we opened a, a neonatal school for people learning special care and needle, neonatal care. So it's quite a big job. And people used to say, well, how, how are you going to manage doctors? But I managed them and I disciplined them as well because they, they had to be responsible to me for the service that they, they, they ran. And uh, it, was, it was quite a big job. And uh, I enjoyed it too. But it, it, also, it also opened the other doors because I, I then uh, was asked by what was called the Maternity Alliance to, to, to join them. And they, they were accountable to this, the government. And so we, we had to make presentations to the select committee in, in government where, where when, when I was at St. George's, we, we started having the what we call the know your midwife scheme where people were given a midwife who they knew would look after them throughout their their pregnancy and throughout their labor and this was bringing in what used to happen in on the community when I, when I was a community midwife and uh, the, the, the government actually took on that took that, idea on board where, where people were given continuity of care, which um, is the, the, the health service is crying out for now. And we're making sure that mothers were given the care that they deserved. So th that, was, that was my idea and, and, and it's now a national way of treating mothers provided they have enough staff to look after them. That's amazing. Okay. I, I, I'm wondering as well, because um, just because we're short for time, what I was I'm interested in kind of exploring as well is I know you've done a lot of voluntary work since you left, um, since you retired, I should say, although although looking at the range of voluntary roles you play, I feel like you haven't retired at all <laughs> and you're probably doing even no, more I haven't. work. <laughs> but um, I know. I, I'm really interested in the work that you do. Um, you were, I think you were representing the UK at Strasbourg, um, yes, the um, European committee that was dealing yes. with inequalities in health. Yes, I was because after after I retired, I, I I thought I'd do other things, and then I got a letter from the Department of Health asking me to represent the UK at Strasbourg for. Um, Inequalities in Health Committee, commit, the committee there. So I was, I, I represented the UK for that for two years. Sorry, what year? And is, it, what it year was really you? looking, sorry? Well, I was wondering what year this was. This was um, in 19, I think it was, it was 1999 when I was appointed. Okay. Yeah, it was. It was the department just because because they knew that that the sort of work that I've had done in the past, and uh, because I know I know for example because, um, a, a lot of uh, women of color are said or black women are said to die um, have complications during pregnancy. There's 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 a lot more. Um, issues yes. around black women and pregnancy, I think, and I, I don't know what that's. What's well, it's 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 that. not only that, um, you need to because um, w w after I retired, I, I went to a conference in Croydon, and they had um, they were talking about 
low birth weight babies, and they were low birth weight babies in African and and African Caribbean babies. Mm. Although the mothers might be the same heights and everything, the babies turned out to be smaller and 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 low birth weight. So I did a research project on that myself and a few other midwives because what I didn't say is is that um, in 1998 I became the first chairman for Agnab because I, I got I, I, and Betty and I we, we were co co founders and uh, and we developed Agnab with the help of people like Sybil Phoenix and um, and quite a few other other prominent people so th that that was something that as I say, there are so many other things that, that went on, but the, the, the question of uh, low birth weight babies was something that is, is really still happening. I mean, and, but we, 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 we found out the reasons why these things were happening mm. because, because our people tend to get less support than, than the, the ordinary mothers, you know, the local mothers. So, so what was the main thing? I mean, when you were when you were um, representing the UK at Strasbourg, what were the key ish inequalities that were being discussed at the time? It it was lack of opportunities for for people in in health and education, and and uh, making sure that that they 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 had the the, the sort of opportunities that they should have because. Say, say, for example, with, 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 with the staffing, when it comes to, to sort of people, people still meet me and say to me, oh, Lynette, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't have been at St. George's because I didn't get the opportunities that, that, that other places were given. People that don't get the, the sort of right nursery places. It, at St. George's, when, when I became the union general manager, I made sure that we had a nursery for, for, for our staff. And, and those were things that I introduced at, at Europe and saying that if you want mothers to go back to work, you have to make sure that they, they, you, you've got the right um, nursery places for children, because I'm one who, who suffered for that, because when, when my child was, didn't, didn't have a, a, somebody to look after her, I had to take her all the way to Guyana to, to, for my mother to look after her. And you know, you know, you you get that sort of de deprivation because because you you get the deprivation of love, you get deprivation of education, things like that, and those were the areas that we were looking at. Thank and you. Um, okay, yeah, no, thank you so much. Um, I, I I wish we had a lot more time, but unfortunately we don't. And as I say, I, I guess I'm hope what I hope comes out of this Guyana speaks is that people get a sense of. Um, just a, a glimpse into how much has been contributed um but i hope that we can then have a part two where we where we delve in much deeper but i just i love this slide here where obviously you've been you you received the golden arrow award um and and well, i was, I, yeah, I know you've received the so um what i wanted to know is so this book here nursing a nation is this um it's a collection it's a collection of, of of, of nurses who, who made a contribution to, to the NHS. I see. Uh, so, so, um, so was this and, is there a particular just, ceremony where you're holding the book up? Um, oh, I, I received an award from, from, I belong to a group called the Sir Optimists and, and, and they gave me an award, a humanitarian award because I had set up a breakfast club in, in Guyana and and the, out of that, I, it, it it was in in bed for acting. Okay. And at at, at the school there, where, where we we set up a library, a, the breakfast club, and people donated um, computers to me, so I was able to link up that school in Guyana to a school in Croydon, and uh, and that that is that idea is still going. So was the is the breakfast club? Is it that the the 
children are provided with breakfast. Um, well, well that, that, that happened when, when, when the breakfast club started. It, it, that started in 2005 mm -hmm. when, when um, the medical officer of health in, in Guyana told, told me when I was visiting Guyana that the children were going to school without breakfast. They were having this big lunch bag, but they had nothing in the bag. And that was because it, it was it, because of poverty. Mm. And uh, they, all they had was a bit of sugar water and, you know, n nothing, nothing substantial. Mm. So I came back and I spoke to Agnap about it and, and, and we, we raised funds for it. And I spoke to this Roftimus who I belong to. And, and we, we raised money for, for them to, to have breakfast um, made for them. And for, for somebody to, to, to sort of provide them with a the breakfast. But after a year or so, um, the, 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 the organization called Feed, for the, Feed the Poor, they took over and were able to, to take over that project. But I also started the audiology service in Guyana when I visited there. And that was in 1998. When, when they, they had no he, hearing facilities, and I, I contacted the Commonwealth Society for the Deaf and ACNAP, and I became a director for the Commonwealth Society for the Deaf, and raised, we raised a quarter of a million pounds in order to give Guyana a comprehensive hearing service. So we trained the doctor, four nurses, technicians, and supplied them with a, a hearing service there. And uh, that was, um, that is still going because the government took over the service after it was handed over to them. But that was my initiative that caused that to happen. Um, Lynette, so, I, I, I'm fascinated by this because it feels like your trajectory. I mean, when I was trying to, when I had, I mean, I, I've only got a, a glimpse into your career, but what I've seen of it is that you really just powered ahead and became successful at every level. And I, I want to know, what can that kind of really be attributed to? Because when, when, when I hear a lot of these kind of Windrush stories and the challenges that a lot of uh, women of color um, faced within nursing, listening to all of the people who've spoken today, you've all, it seems like you just transcend everything and, and does, it makes no difference. And I'm wondering what the secret is, like how, <laughs> how have you smashed the ceiling? <laughs> I, I, th I think it's the Guyanese in us. I think, I think, I think, I think it's the way we were brought up. You always mm -hmm. not, not only think of yourself, but you think, you think of others. No matter how long you're, you're here in, 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 in England. I mean, I've been here over 60 years now. Mm. And I've been, I, my, my heart is still in, in Guyana. I might be mm. here, but I'm, I'm, I'm always thinking of, of Guyana and thinking, what can we do to help? Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's, it, that is us. And I think, I think we pass it on to our, our children and, and they, they, they carry, carry on. I don't, my daughter is, 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 works a lot for, for Ghana and, and, and we, 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 have, we have family, well, we, 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 don't have, we don't have any family left right there now, but we, we have our hearts there. Mm. And whenever we go to Ghana, for example, whenever I go there, I want to check the, the hearing service. I want to see how they're doing. And I want to check the breakfast service. I want to see how, how the cancer service is doing. All those things we need to know because we want to help. But now, again, they probably would be soon in a better position and they probably wouldn't need as much help as we, we, we used to give. Yeah. Because there was a time when, 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 when I was closing the hospitals at South London and, and, uh, and Hyde Park and, and opening St. George's and the, su the supplies department would say to me, Lynn, do you, do you need anything? And I said to them, whatever you got, I'll take. And what the, and it, anything that was surplus to requirements, they would give to me. I had incubators, I had the lot, everything, anything that they wanted. And uh, so, Ghana benefited from that, from that experience that I had, mm -hmm. and uh, would always do so. 
can I can I just ask you on as as a final question of what what are you most proud? Oh, I, I'm proud of being a Guyanese. I'm I'm proud of uh, you see all most of the people who have been on on the show today. I, I I've, I've known most of them, and I I I'm proud of the people we are because we we are not a selfish people. We 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 look after our, our and care for our people. I am happy that I was in a position when, when I was when I went to Ghana to to actually see what is happening, set up the, the audiology service. I'm happy about the Breakfast Club, and I'm still happy about supporting. I support Lilette because Lilette is now part of In a Wheel, which 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 she which I joined the rain and she she is now um, being a very active member there, and as as a group. We, we support her and uh, so all in all I, I'm just happy to be a Guyanese and so and happy to make sure that I make my contribution and part of being the, part of the diaspora there so whatever they need I, I, I've seen the High Commissioner said, and Gail share and said whatever you need if ever I can do it Provided I have bread in my body, I'm I'm there for Guyana. Wonderful. I I I I don't know if the in fact I might just share it again very quickly because um, I don't know if the audience noticed this was you with Gail to share very recently. Um, yes. At, at the Guyana yeah. High Commission. Yeah. Um, yes. Yes. Uh, that, that 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 is what that is what we were talking about. We were talking about the hearing service. If there's any any more training that is needed whatever is required then i will because I, I i do a lot of work for the commonwealth as well and i've done um getting scholarships for children who, who need help with regard regard their education they might not be able to afford their their, their uniforms mm -hmm. their books and and they they're they're into the they i i support them through the Commonwealth Countries League, who supplies scholarships for children, mm. and it's not only Guyana. If if ever I go anywhere, because I, I I was invited to to Jamaica, where where I got ten children scholarships there, and they invited me to their graduation, so so they could see what they've done with the with the with the the money that was spent for them. Mm. So it's it's. And I, I would do the same for, for Barbados, where, where my husband comes from, because, we, because the, the, I think I, we're all one family, as they say, you know, and, and you just, you just, you just hand wash, hand make, hand complete, you just help each other. That's, that's a really uh, wonderful way to end today's uh, session, that we're all one family. I think certainly what has struck me about all of the speakers <laughs> is that they've contributed both to Guyana and to the UK. Um, I mean, you, you're talking a lot about the work that you've done with, with Guyana, but you've also helped to fundamentally shape different aspects of the NHS as well in all the work that you've done. And so we're, I'm immensely proud. Um, I, I, the smile on my face says it all. I think I can feel myself <laughs> beaming from ear to ear. Um, but, uh, yeah, thank you so much, um, Lynette. It's, thank you, thank you very much. Um, wonderful to have you share your story. And um, I'm so sorry you had to wait for so long. <laughs> uh, today, That's all right. I, I, I it know was interesting I, listening to others. Yeah, I know I was trying to squash into, um, a, a, a lot of people into the program, but I think it gives everyone a strong sense of just how much has been contributed. So thank you to you. And uh, thank you. Thank you to everybody else who's contributed to this program. It's been really fascinating, I think. And um, could, could I just come back before you close? Please, uh, please, um, do. Yeah. please do. Please. Just two quick things. <laughs> a lot of the um, what has been said uh, by the nurses Several of the nurses are in this this publication, which um, Lynette just mentioned, uh, and and it's uh, an anthology of African and Caribbean contributions to Britain's health services, nursing a nation. It's a very heavy book, uh, but uh, if you can encourage your libraries uh, to order it, it would be good to have our colleagues in Britain 
to see what the nurses have done in Britain. It really is a, a tremendous work done by the Nubian Jack Foundation. And, uh, you know, we, we should be proud of that. Just other, one quick thing. Um, you mentioned about uh, Guy Health UK and what we have done in the past. But just for the audience information, we continue to, to do that. And I'd like to uh, pay public tribute to people who are involved with me in helping Guyana and just quickly uh, mention their names. Um, Betty Y, uh, Sherlene Rodder, uh, Dr. Lola Onini, Oni, uh, Dr. Helen uh, Ann Mitchell, uh, Dr. Syringa Deer, Dr. Devindra Sharma, uh, Dr. Deepa uh, Bose, they're Miss, but they're surgeons, uh, Dr. Samantha Tross and Luke Ramnerine. They are part of the Guy Health uh, UK and Associates who are working on seven different uh, projects in Guyana. Uh, one of our colleagues uh, mentioned Dr. Lal. Uh, Dr. Lal is involved with us in the reduction uh, of um, substance uh, misuse. Oh. So um, uh, uh, there, there are uh, various projects in train. We are mindful that Guyana has entered into um, arrangements uh, with uh, uh, companies in um, uh, organizations in the US and in Canada. Uh, but uh, as far as the UK is concerned, the audience would have seen the considerable amount of expertise, which together we are providing um, uh, in different areas. Thanks. Thank you so much um, for that, Peter. And you're reminding me just to say as well that, I mean, Guyanese have contributed in so many different ways to the NHS here, but also to Guyana. And um, you remind you remind me that um, to mention uh, Deepa Bose and also Samantha Trust as being the two top orthopedic surgeons. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that Samantha Tross is the first female orthopedic surgeon in Europe, as well as the first black orthopedic surgeon in Europe. Is that right? I know that she's the first black orthopedic surgeon in, in the UK. Okay. I'm not, okay. I'm not, I'm not, okay. I'm not sure of the rest, rest of Europe, but yeah, I, she's an excellent person yeah. who has actually recently done hands-on surgery teaching in Guyana, uh, uh, Deepa and Samantha uh, have helped to develop a master's program in orthopedic surgery, which is really excellent. Um, so Guyanese are holding their weight uh, in the UK as much as uh, uh, Guyanese are in other parts of the world. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions that they want to ask the speakers. We could maybe do five minutes, but um, uh, you know, the program's kind of gone on a lot longer. So I know you've all been on for a long time. Does anybody have any questions? Let me just see whether there's anything in the chat. Um, I mean, there's a lot of a lot of thank yous in the chat, basically. Uh, uh, thank you, Auntie Lynette, for being a trailblazer. Uh, <laughs> lots of beautiful uh, words. Thank you to the speakers. Um, yeah, basically, well done, and and thank you for all the remarkable stories. Um, so yeah, I think I I think I'm going to leave it there. Um, but I would love to do a, a part two where maybe there were just three people so we could go into the stories a bit more uh, deeply. But, um, but I think it's been a really great way of just getting a sense of, of how much all of you have contributed. And I, I'm just amazed by the, you know, you've got your own full time job, your normal job, but all the voluntary and extracurricular work that goes on outside of it is something to be really tremendously proud of. So thank you all for sharing your stories. And uh, just to say, wish you all a uh, happy rest of the weekend. And I hope you'll join us again um, on the last Sunday of next month, 27th of November, for a celebration of Stanley Greaves. But for now, thank you so much to everyone who's been involved in the medical okay. sector. And, th and, and thank you and Rod for putting this on. Excellent. Everyone, let's put the chairs. Thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good night, everyone, and take care. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Bye.